Recording in progress. Good afternoon and welcome. I will, would first like to remind everyone to please mute your line when you are not speaking. Slide two, please. I could please have slide two. Slide two, please. For Meteor in Press, the FDA press contact is Audra Harrison. Her email is currently displayed. Slide three, please. My name is Henry Royal, and I will be chairing this meeting. I will now call the August 1st, 2023 Medical Imaging Drugs Advisory Committee to order. Rhea Bott is the acting designated federal officer for this meeting and will begin with introductions. Good morning. My name is Rhea Bott, and I'm the acting designated federal officer for this meeting. When I call your name, please unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Please introduce yourself by stating your name and affiliation for the record. We'll begin with MIDAC members, starting with Dr. Bolch. Dr. Bolch, here from Florida. Thank you, Dr. Bolch. Next, we have Dr. Hackney. David Hackney from uh, Harvard University, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Herskovich. Peter Herskovich, National Institutes of Health Clinical Center, Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you, Dr. Herskovich. Next, we have Dr. Jacobs. Paula Jacobs, National Cancer Institute, Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Oates. Hi, Liz Oates, uh, University of Kentucky. Thank you, Dr. Oates. Next, Dr. Sangani. I am Rupa Sangani. I'm a nuclear cardiologist at Rush University in Chicago. Thank you. Next, we have our industry representative, Dr. Minton. Mark Minton from Eli Lilly and Company and Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals. Thank you, Dr. Minton. Next, we'll move on to our temporary voting members, starting with Dr. Applegate. Good morning, I'm Kimberly Applegate, a pediatric radiologist, uh, retired from the University of Kentucky in Lexington. Thank you, Dr. Applegate. Next, we have Dr. Deva Raja. I um, am Yuni Devaraja, Department of Radiology, University of Michigan. Thank you. Next, we have our patient representative, Ms. Gillespie. Hi, Terry Gillespie, uh, patient advocate, Chicago, Illinois. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Larson. David Larson, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Next, we have Dr. Nedro. Hi, uh, Jesse Nedro, uh, University of Pittsburgh, uh, the Hillman Cancer Center. Thank you, Dr. Nedro. Next, we have our chairperson, Dr. Royal. Hi, 
Um, I'm at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you, Dr. Royal. And Dr. Shong. In Jishong, Washington University School of Medicine, St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Next, we'll move on to introductions of our FDA participants. First, we have Dr. Ganley. Are the FDA participants able to introduce themselves? First, we have uh, Dr. Ganley. For crafting, the Director for Safety, uh, Medical Imaging Div uh, and Radiation Medicine Division. Thank you. Samantha Cotter. Safety Evaluator from the Division of Pharmacovigilance in the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology at FDA. Jonathan Cohen, Supervisory Pharmacologist Supporting Imaging and Radiation Medicine. Danica Pluku, uh, Physicist at the Division of Imaging and Radiation Medicine at CEDAR. Anthony Fertinos, Clinical Team Leader in the Division of Imaging and Radiation Medicine. Alex Hoffling, Deputy Director, Division of Imaging and Radiation Medicine. Lou Marzella, and I'm the Director of the Division of Imaging and Radiation Medicine. Thank you. That concludes um, panel and FDA introductions. And back to you, Dr. Royal. Uh, for the topics such as those being discussed at this meeting, there are often a variety of opinions some of which are strongly held. Our goal is that this meeting be, fair, be a fair and open forum for discussion of the, these issues, and that individuals can express their views without interruption. Thus, as a gentle reminder, individuals will be allowed to speak into the record only if recognized by the chairperson. We look forward to a productive meeting. In the spirit of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and the government in the Sunshine Act, we ask that the advisory committee members take care that their conversations about the topic at hand take place in the open forum of this meeting. We are aware that members of the media are anxious to speak with the FDA about these proceedings. However, the FDA will refrain from discussing the details of this meeting until its conclusion. Also, the committee is reminded to please refrain from discussing the meeting topics during breaks. Thank you. Rhea Bott will read the conflict of interest statement for the meeting. Thank you, Dr. Royal. The Food and Drug Administration is convening today's meeting of the Medical Imaging Drugs Advisory Committee under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act of FACA of 1972. With the exception of the industry representative, all members and temporary voting members of the committee are special government employees or regular federal employees from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws covered by, but not limited to, those found at 18 U.S.C. Section 208 is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. FDA has determined that members and temporary voting members of this committee are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, 
Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular federal employees who have potential financial conflicts when it is determined that the agency's need for special government employees services outweighs their potential financial conflict of interest or when the interest of a regular federal employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Related to the discussions of today's meeting, members and temporary voting members of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflicts of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouses or minor children, and for purposes of 18 U.S.C. Section 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert, with expert witness testimony, contracts, grants, CRADAs, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. Today's agenda involves a discussion of dosimetry data needed to support the initial clinical study in an original IND application for certain new positron emission tomography or PET drugs. FDA would like to obtain the committee's input on the following. One, the sufficiency of available data from animal or human studies involving certain positron emitting radionuclides, for example, carbon-11 and fluorine-18, to allow a reasonable calculation of radiation absorbed dose to the whole body and critical organs upon administration of a new PET drug containing certain radionuclides to a human subject in first in human studies, and two, the reasonableness of a proposed list of numerical radioactivity thresholds for new PET drugs containing these radionucle radionuclides, such that phase one studies that will both A, administer sub-threshold activities, and B, obtain sufficient human data for dosimetry calculations may be found safe to proceed in the absence of dosimetry data based on prior animal administration of the new pet drugs under investigation. This is a particular matters meeting during which general issues will be discussed. Based on the agenda for today's meeting and all financial interests reported by the committee members and temporary voting members, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued in connection with this meeting. To ensure transparency, we encourage all standing committee members and temporary voting members to disclose any public statements that they have made concerning the topic at issue. With respect to FDA's invited industry representative, we would like to disclose that Dr. Mark Minton is participating in this meeting as a non-voting industry representative acting on behalf of regulated industry. Dr. Minton's role at this meeting is to represent industry in general and not any particular company. Dr. Minton is employed by Eli Lilly and company. With regards to FDA's guest speaker, the agency has has determined that the information to be provided by the speaker is essential. Dr. William Hallett has acknowledged that he is employed by Invicro as head of imaging physics. As a guest speaker, Dr. Hallett will not participate in committee deliberations, nor will he vote. We would like to remind members and temporary voting members that if the discussions involve any other topics not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to exclude themselves from such involvement and their exclusion will be noted for the record. FDA encourages all other participants to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have regarding the topic that could be affected by the committee's discussions. Thank you, and back to you, Dr. Royal. We will now proceed with the FDA introductory comments from Dr. Anthony Fultonos. Um, uh, I'm not sure these are the correct uh, slides. 
Oh, no, that's the correct slide. Great. Um, good afternoon. I'm Anthony Fotinos, nuclear medicine physician and clinical team leader in the Division of Imaging and Radiation Medicine. Welcome to the Medical Imaging Drugs Advisory Committee. Last time this committee met, our division was known as the Division of Medical Imaging Products, or DMIP. But in 2017, our name changed, so now we go by DIRM or DIRM. Next slide. FDA convened this advisory committee meeting to discuss issues involving pre-IND and phase one radiation dosimetry data for certain groups of new positron emission tomography or PET drugs. First, a comment regarding scope. Today's meeting is classified as a general matter type meeting. This means that product, sponsor, and or application specific issues and questions will not be discussed, nor are any thumbs up or down votes planned. Rather, this general matter issue, the general matter issue we will be discussing reflects stakeholder concern regarding burden of animal dosimetry data collection for certain groups of new pet imaging drugs. The rationale for meeting is stakeholder and FDA's preliminary position that data already available often allows reasonable calculation of radiation risk for human subjects prior to collection of phase one dosimetry data. Next slide. Where we need your advice is regarding sponsors of new INDs for certain groups of pet drugs, specifically when sponsors would prefer not to submit drug-specific animal dosimetry data. We will be asking you to discuss the sufficiency of review dosimetry data and the reasonableness of the approach under consideration for investigational administration prior to the availability of phase one dosimetry data, such that for administration less than or equal to X, FDA may generally find administered activities safe to proceed from a radiation safety perspective, whereas for administration greater than X, the status quo will be maintained of case-by-case -case IND review regarding the reasonableness of available animal or human dosimetry data. As you will learn in greater detail later, the approach under consideration is essentially a leveraging approach where X is derived from dosing and administration FDA has already found to be safe and effective in corresponding prescribing information. Next slide. You should have a copy of the complete agenda. Here is a brief outline. Dr. Hallett, medical physicist at Invicro, will provide a scientific overview and share his perspective from industry. Then, Dr. Zanodi Freganora, staff scientist from the section on pet neuroimaging science and branch of molecular imaging at the National Institute of Mental Health, NIH, will share his perspective from an active translational laboratory. FDA will speak next. Dr. Pliku, our division's medical physicist, will provide a summary of FDA's systematic review of publicly available dosimetry data and discuss the approach under consideration. Finally, Dr. Cohen from the Office of Rare Diseases, Pediatrics, Urology, and Reproductive Medicine, and Dr. Cotter from the Office of Pharmacovigilance and Epidemiology will provide brief perspectives on pet drug radiation safety from their pharmacology, toxicology, and pharmacovigilance disciplines, respectively. Finally, there will be an open public hearing, and then the discussion questions will be posed to the panel. Next slide. But first, I'd, I'd briefly like to introduce pet drugs within a broader regulatory and historical context. This table spans the next two slides and encapsulates some regulatory milestones at the intersection of nuclear medicine and FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Highlighted in yellow for each year is the introduction of a formal definition within federal act, regulation, or guidance of a term specifically relevant to the field of nuclear medicine. Since these terms may often be, more loose, uh, be, more, be used more loosely elsewhere, I hope this regulatory introduction also helps to keep us all on the same page in terms of nomenclature. The table starts in 1975. That's when new drug regulation defined the term radioactive drug as a drug or biological product exhibiting spontaneous disintegration of unstable nuclei with the emission of nuclear particles or photons. These 1975 regulations also ended an exception agreed to in 1963 with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, then called the Atomic Energy Commission, for oversight of investigational use and provided certain new authority for oversight of basic research to FDA-authorized 
Radioactive Drug Research Committees, or RDRCs, a program that remains in place to this day. The year 1987 saw a rewrite of FDA's IND regulation, including two sentences on radioactive drugs and data on radiation absorbed dose. We'll come back to these two sentences shortly because they provide an essential framework for today's discussion. Fast forward 10 years to 1997. That's the year Congress passed the FDA Modernization Act, or FDAMA. FDAMA defined a new subset of radioactive drugs using the term PET drugs. FDAMA defined PET drugs as articles exhibiting spontaneous disintegration of emitted, um, uh, spontaneous disintegration of unstable nuclei by the emission of positron particles. Emitted positron particles annihilate locally with electrons to release dual 511 keV photons from where they are capable of leaving the body for diagnostic imaging with a PET camera. Fodama also defined an encompassing group of radioactive drugs using the term radiopharmaceutical, including single photon emitters, and defined by a common uh, intended use of diagnosing or monitoring rather than treating disease. Next slide. In 1999, Part 315 was added to the Code of Federal Regulations directly after Part 314, the part describing new drug applications. 21 CFR 315 further applied the statutory requirements outlined two years earlier under FDAMA for diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals, as did CEDAR's three-part guidance published in 2004 entitled Developing Medical Imaging Drugs and Biological Products. Most recently, in 2017, the FDA Reauthorization Act, or FDARA, introduced a new 520P pathway for approving certain new uses of approved drugs under 510K de novo or PMA device marketing applications. Notably, under Section 706, FDARA expanded the definition of contrast agent. Under this expanded definition, contrast agents include both diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals and non-radioactive drugs with both essentially defined by their shared characteristic of serving to increase relative signal intensity for diagnostic or monitoring purposes. Finally, less than a year ago, in the Food and Drug Omnibus Reform Act of 2022, Congress again leveraged an expansive definition of contrast agent to clarify that all radioactive drugs and all medical imaging agents remain legally defined as drugs. Next slide. For those who might prefer to see information visually, this slide provides a Venn-like depiction of the terms just highlighted. Again, from a regulatory perspective, this meeting provides an opportunity to discuss pre-IND and phase one dosimetry data at the intersection of PET drugs, the box at slide center, and 21 CFR 312.23, the IND dosimetry regulation introduced above and excerpted in full on the slide that follows. Next slide. Under the heading Additional Information, FDA's IND regulation states that in certain applications, as described below, information on special topics may be needed. Such information shall be submitted as follows. If the drug is a radioactive drug, sufficient data from animal or human studies to allow a reasonable calculation of radioactive absorbed dose to the whole body and critical organs upon administration to a human subject. Phase one studies of radioactive drugs must include studies which will obtain sufficient data for dosimetry calculations. With this basic regulatory foundation introduced, I'll conclude by previewing FDA's discussion points to the advisory committee. Next slide. These will be displayed again after the guest speaker and FDA presentations and open public hearing at the end of the afternoon. First, we will ask the committee to discuss the sufficiency of reviewed data from animal or human studies involving fluorine-18, carbon-11, gallium-68, copper-64, rubidium-82, and ammonia-13 to allow a reasonable calculation of radiation-absorbed dose to the whole body and critical organs upon first-in-human administration of a new PET drug containing one of these radionuclides. Next slide. Second, we will ask the committee to discuss the reasonableness of the approach under consideration involving administered activities for new PET drugs containing one of these radionuclides, such that phase one studies that will both initially administer one or more activity levels less than or equal 
to the value specified and collects sufficient human data for dosimetry calculations may generally be found safe to proceed from a radiation safety perspective in the absence of dosimetry data based on prior animal administration of the new pet drug under investigation. I will now turn the podium over to our first guest speaker, Dr. Hallett. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to give you a perspective uh, somewhat from the uh, UK because uh, the imaging center that I work in is based in the UK. Could I have the next slide, please? So this is our facility uh, in London. Uh, it uh, was originally uh, built by GlaxoSmithKline uh, to support uh, drug development. And to cut a long story short, uh, it's, it's now part of in vitro. Um, we have imaging uh, centers both in the US and the UK. The UK one uh, is uh, essentially a pet facility, and we mostly work with carbon-11 and fluorine-18 and not some of the other uh, longer-lived isotopes that you, you mentioned there. So I can only really give you a perspective on that aspect. Can I have the next slide, please? So I'm going to set the scene for the discussion today. I, I realize this is a panel of experts, and much of this will be familiar, but hopefully it's useful for other people dialing in and, and listening into this. So why do we need radiation dosimetry? And the, the driver for this is that the basic principles of a radiation protection that apply to medical exposures are that we should justify and optimize those exposures. And from a European perspective, in the EU, there is the Basic Safety Standards Directive, uh, the UK, of course, has left the EU, but we're still going to follow the same abiding principles and the relevant legislation in the UK uh, that uh, followed on from the basic safety standards is the ionising radiations, medical exposure regulations, and that's unlikely to significantly change. So in terms of the radiation dose to clinical subjects, in terms of imaging, we are really considering stochastic risks at relatively low dose, and those risks are to some extent a little bit uncertain. We would be working below the threshold for, for tissue effects, for example, in nearly all cases in PET. So for patients, that's implemented using diagnostic reference levels, which are generally agreed um, guidance levels for particular procedures. Uh, there's no dose limit as such. For research subjects, we need to uh, obtain ethical approval, and um, we, we have to uh, provide uh, some uh, estimate of risk from the, radio for the, from the radiation exposure. Uh, we, we need to put that in some context that can be uh, understood by the subject and appreciated in terms of other risks. For example, equivalent background exposures, um, the increased potential risk of cancer induction later in life. And the, the, the formal framework for that is to use what we call dose constraints. And there are guidelines surrounding those constraints. Could we have the next slide, please? So just going back to basics and reviewing the framework that we use for radiation dose, we start with the absorbed dose, which is the energy transferred by radiation to the subject per unit mass. And for imaging procedures, we are in the milligray domain, which is you know, millijoules per kilogram of tissue. So the next slide, please. So uh, radiation risk also depends not only on the, uh, on the administered uh, radiopharmaceutical or, or drug, but also on the where it goes in the body, the tissues, the organs that are exposed. Uh, the, the radiation sensitivity of those tissues is, is known to uh, differ from, from one, one uh, organ to the next. And that's, in, that's encoded in these radiation, uh, sorry, tissue weighting factors. We also have radiation weighting factors, but 
in the context of PET or PET CT, even uh, those factors are all one, so we can more or less ignore that. And then the effective dose is to sum those contributions over all the organs. It's a weighted sum, and the unit there is the CBIT. And just to set that in context, uh, for the UK, the background average background radiation dose is something like 2.3 millisieverts per year. For employees, there is a dose limit, which is 20 millisieverts a year, but uh, it's very few radiation workers would get anywhere near those kinds of uh, occupational exposures. And in terms of translating that into a risk, uh, the ICRP recommended uh, risk factor is one in 20,000, although as I've already mentioned, it's somewhat uncertain at low dose. Next slide, please. So overall, then, we can say that factors affecting PET doses are the uh, PET drug, the, the, the uh, radioisotope that's being delivered, and then how the body uh, processes that in terms of biodistribution and excretion. So you can generalize those factors in terms of the subject's age, sex, weight, health, their uh, current condition. Uh, there's the, the classic example of that is with FDG, where you get a different uptake pattern if the subject has recently eaten to, to being fasted, and obviously you want to standardize uh, against that. Uh, next slide, please. So the standard approach to PET to symmetry is to use a, a mathematical model uh, that contains a simplified human uh, phantom we know that a uniform body distribution is simply too inaccurate if we assume that. And in order to obtain uh, the distribution in the body, we need to uh, get some information either from a preclinical uh, experiment in, say, rodents, where we can take tissue samples, or an imaging study. And the results of, of such a, a calculation enable us to compare medical exposures and different pet drugs and estimate radiation risk, but they are not accurate enough to individually plan doses. We're not actually measuring the doses to organs. And at the bottom there, you can see the difference between a sort of simple uh, uniform estimation and uh, a, a more sophisticated one taking account of biodistribution. Next slide, please. So the inputs into that model that we need to obtain are uh, the uh, measurements of radioactivity concentration at different time points. We then integrate that over time and uh, then multiply by a standardized organ mass to obtain these uh, time integrated activity coefficients. Uh, you can think of it as a residence time, a mean residence time in the organ because it has the units of time. Uh, next slide, please. So these, this is the Olinda code, which is now the widely used uh, code to do these calculations. The beauty of this is that all the complicated physics calculations in terms of absorbed dose within an organ and between organs has already been done. You just need to input the actual activities in each organ. And if you just click on, you, you can see the output of that. I just want to click the next, should come on. There you go. So you get the, you get the uh, organ absorbed and equivalent doses and also the, the summed uh, effective doses, uh, depending on which weighting factor scheme you, you want to use. So next slide, please. So for a preclinical PET dosimetry experiment, you give the, uh, I'm talking about rodents here particularly, if you, you give the tracer to multiple subjects, uh, one, one subject per, per time point, uh, the, you then harvest the organs at that time point, uh, you weigh uh, samples and count the radioactivity in uh, a, a gamma counter, a multi-well counter is really ideal here because you have quite a lot of samples to count when you've got a half, uh, short half-life to contend with then you have to scale that information to, uh, to uh, in some way, uh, adjust it to the human situation. So what you're doing there really is adjusting for the relative 
uh, organ uh, weights and also the, the total body weight. You can't possibly uh, adjust for differences in metabolism. And then these uh, resulting coefficients are entered into the code, Alinda in this case. So if you could go on to the next slide, please. So for a clinical study, uh, we give the tracer to multiple human subjects uh, for carbon-11 or fluorin-18. The scans will take anywhere between 90 minutes to four hours. Uh, we, we do uh, multiple time points, perhaps a six or so, uh, increasing the spacing between them as, as post-injection. And then we can generate the same curve. So if you, I think if you press the next, press on, you'll see a little movie there. There we go. Uh, then you have to generate your uh, um, uh, your data in terms of drawing regions of interest over the the organs, and then that's what's input into Alinda. Next slide, I think. Oh, I think we may get yeah. There we go. So that's us in. That's our uh, drawing the regions of interest over the CT that we get as a as a convenient uh, extra bit of data. We need the CT anyway for attenuation correction purposes. Next slide, please. There we go. Sorry, that's just, just the curves that you generate. So next slide, please. Yeah, so just to summarize the data that we've collected over the years, we've done 24 dissimilarity studies since 2012, uh, mostly in the rat, but some in human. You can see that the uh, carbon eleven ones cluster quite tightly around five, five and a half uh, microsieverts per megabecquerel. For fluorine eighteen, there's a bit more of a spread, but again, it's clustering around 24, 25 microsieverts per megabecquerel. So, on average, we, we get, you know, a, a fairly consistent answer. Uh, if you look at um, where we've done both preclinical and human dosimetry, well, clearly there's a difference there in those two cases. Um, where we've repeated the uh, preclinical study, which is not something we would normally have to do, but where we've done it, even years apart, we get a very similar result. And so this suggests that uh, the methodology is, is repeatable, at least within center, but there is some difference between preclinical and human uh, estimation. If we could move on to the next slide, please. So in terms of study timelines, uh, for a preclinical study, we've sometimes been asked to do it in as quickly as possible. And um, as long as you have uh, the staff available and equipment is available, uh, the, the fastest turnaround we've been able to do is about a month. Um, if you click on uh, for comparison, in a clinical uh, study, it's a much longer process. Uh, you have to make sure that you can produce the radio pharmaceutical to GMP standard because it's going into man. Uh, you have to uh, get all your regulatory approval done, including ethics as well as um, expert opinion on the on the use of a particular uh, radio pharmaceutical. You have to recruit your subjects that can take months, it can be uh, harder to get a patient group if that's what you're interested in. Then you've got to do a more complicated analysis involving uh, region drawing over the, uh, over the images and so on. All of this uh, adds time. And so we're talking about a year, something like a year. It's also uh, at least an order of magnitude more expensive. Uh, next slide, please. So looking at this slightly different way, in terms of our in-house dissymmetry, we've done 17 clinical uh, ligands, carbon-11, fluorine-18 only. Uh, another 55 ligands used clinically where we've got the dissymmetry from other sources. And, and you can see from the literature and, and those other sources that there's a variable uh, quality in the data, differences in um, in the methodology used. Some of the data has quite, you know, been around for a while. The scanners have improved considerably since then, uh, different species used. Uh, there are details that are, uh, to some extent, unknown or just aren't mentioned in the, in the source that you're looking at. And for example, what's the, what's the assumptions made about uh, emptying of the bladder? 
Um, you know, are they all healthy or some are patients and so on. Uh, nonetheless, uh, on average, you know, this is sort of consistent uh, between clinical and preclinical. Um, so for, for carbon 11, it's coming out around five within two uh, microsieverts from Vega Becquerel. F18, uh, around 25, a bit bigger range. And you, I guess you don't really know whether it's it's due to methodology or, or metabolism, and almost certainly there's contributions from both in there. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of translation, I've already mentioned that uh, you can have a discordancy between the, the preclinical and clinical estimate can be higher or lower, in fact. Um, so there's examples of both there. Uh, but again, the, the within center, within our center, the methodology seems to be repeatable. It's just the translation that's less so. Next slide, please. So to summarize what those limitations of preclinical dissymmetry are, there's differences in metabolism, which you can't really correct for. Expect it to be more rapid in smaller species. There are differences in anatomy. Uh, Famously, the, the, the rat lacks a gallbladder, so that affects the uh, dose that you see in the small intestine. You have to extrapolate renal excretion from your preclinical experiment to a human voiding model. Uh, for, so for a particular tracer, it, uh, it's fair to say it's, it's not reliable, really, for, for the human uh, dissymmetry estimate. And that's even true for non-human primates, which we don't do in the UK. Uh, but just looking at the at the literature, there's still differences. In terms of um, arguments for and against preclinical dissymmetry, well, there's always a, 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 an intention to reduce the uh, number of animals used in research wherever possible. On the other hand, it does give uh, sort of forewarning at an early stage of development of any unusual kinetics or uptake but it's, it's fair to say that it's um, not really a reliable predictor for human dissymmetry in an individual case. The next slide, please. So I've been asked to comment on the differences in the radiation protection uh, frameworks between Europe and the US. So in Europe, including the UK, uh, the, it's the effective dose that we look at. And um, the the guidance is to keep that below 10 millisieverts a year for healthy subjects. Uh, it, you can it, it, you can exceed that in certain situations, for example, with a with a, a, a group a subject group with reduced life expectancy or more elderly subjects because of the reduction in radiation risk with age. You need more justification for younger healthy subjects. We we never scan uh, below 18, for example. Um, Preclinical data is considered acceptable if no human data is available. Uh, and in fact, we've even done uh, dissimilarity studies where we had uh, no preclinical data at all. Uh, that would have to be justified on an individual basis. So that limit of, or, or guide, I shouldn't say limit, it's very much a guidance, uh, is also applicable to dissimilarity studies. So uh, if you're doing a dissymmetry study in healthy volunteers, you've still got to keep within your 10 millisieverts a year, and that includes the CT component, which can be as much as half of the, the, the dose for a, a, a dissymmetry study in, in man. Uh, in the US, uh, my understanding is that you're looking at both the effective dose and uh, the organ uh, critical organ doses, and usually staying within 50 millisieverts a year. Or, or 30 millisieverts for more radiosensitive organs. But this leads to typically higher doses in the US than, than in Europe. If you could move on to the next slide, please. So this is the guidance from our regulator in the UK, and you can see that uh, for, um, for an application to use a, a novel PET tracer, uh, they would like an estimate of the effective dose, which is based on the best available information at the time. But there is a lot of flexibility in that. They're, they're a panel of experts, and they will uh, take into account uh, other factors, uh, such as traces with a very similar, uh, expected a very similar profile, for example. Uh, next slide, please. 
So in terms of the European guidance for radio diagnostics, which are, which are radio tracers, which may have a widespread clinical application, uh, they, the, the, uh, the requirements are in terms of pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, and toxicology. And the pharmacokinetics would include a dosimetry uh, component. Uh, the toxicology for, for these tracers where uh, the, there is expected to be no pharmacological effect and it's given a very low dose can be a sort of reduced tox package. So next slide, please. So in terms of what the impact is on study design within our centre, we, we mostly do brain, although we also do whole body studies as well. You can see that if you're work, trying to work within a 10 millisievert per annum uh, uh, dose constraint, uh, you're talking about something like as uh, only only up to four uh, carbon-11 uh, scans. That's usually more than we need. Um, not many studies need four. And you may have an extended uh, 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 time in which to do those, so that would be relaxed a bit. But for fluorine 18, that really limits you to about two scans within a year. But if you're looking at disease progression, you're probably looking over a longer time scale anyway. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, thinking a little bit ahead about what might be alternative approaches to performing these dissymmetry studies, either in, in a preclinical clinical situation for short-lived traces, well, one approach would be to uh, consider a, a conservative a default effective dose. I don't, I don't wish to propose a particular uh, figure, but um, uh, most tracers would fall below uh, the, the figures that I've given there. Um, if you then need to uh, characterize that uh, a bit more in man, because uh, you know you, you have, you're not sure about that, you could consider a, a single whole body human scan to characterize uptake. I know that approach is used in, in some centers uh, in Europe. Uh, the question would be whether that was uh, sufficiently representative of the population you want to study. And then moving on, if, you're, if that tracer is going to be used more widely, uh, for example, if it's going to be used as a, a, a clinical uh, radio diagnostic, at that point, you might want to consider uh, actually performing a, a proper human dissymmetry study. But that wouldn't really apply uh, to most carbon-11 uh, labeled uh, PET drugs. Thank you. I think that's Sarah. Next slide. I think we're at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hallett. Uh, we'll, we will now proceed with a speaker presentation from Dr. Pablo Zanati Fraganara. Hi. Good morning. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to this meeting. Okay. So my name is Pablo Zanati Fraganara, and I work. Uh, in a lab in the National Institute of Mental Health uh, called Molecular Imaging Branch. Okay, this is a lab uh, whose goal is to create a new PET tracers. So essentially for brain disease. So therefore we are often in the situation where we inject uh, new radio ligands in humans under INDs. And of course, among the usual safety assessment, we need to have an estimation of the dosimetry. I'm talking only about uh, carbon-11 and F18 here because these are the isotopes uh, that we use. Uh, okay, in the past years, we tried to simplify and streamline the dosimetry part of the validation of new ligands. And we summarized our uh, approach and proposal in uh, three opinion papers that were published in the journals of our field. And the scope of this talk is to give you an overview of these three papers and explain the rationale behind them. So next slide, thank you. So uh, to summarize the main points, uh, uh, animal dosimetry is resource intensive and poorly predicts uh, human values. Uh, human dosimetry is even more expensive, exposes multiple subjects to radiation, and you may find out at the end that the tracer does not work. Okay, 
because uh, creating new pet radioligands is a type of, of research with a high risk of failure, okay? And uh, it's only when you really explore the, the organ, like the brain, that you discover whether the tracer works or not. And finally, the dose for uh, specifically carbon-11 tracers, uh, we think is very predictable and primarily based on the half-life of, of the isotope. So the proposed solution would be uh, to abandon animal dosimetry for both A15 and uh, carbon-11, to postpone human dosimetry until the tracer is proven to work, and uh, specifically abandon human carbon-11 dosimetry, even in humans, and use an average dose. Okay, next slide, thank you. Okay, until, uh, let's say 10 years ago, uh, this was the traditional pathway of use at the, at the NIH. So we would, for new radio ligands for, so we will first perform a human dosimetry in monkeys. I'm aware that the FDA does not mandate the use of monkeys, okay, but we used uh, monkeys as a model because we have easy access to monkeys and they are of course the, better, the, the best model. Once the dosimetry monkey was done, we will do uh, dosimetry in humans, which means acquiring five to 10 whole body scans and uh, calculating the, the dosimetry. Once the dosimetry is known, then we will test the validity of the new tracer, for example, by doing brain studies. Okay, the problem with this pathway is immediately evident. Uh, by the time you discover that the tracer does not work, you have already done uh, all the animals in human, human dosimetry. So you have spent out of money, irradiated subjects, and used the resources for nothing. And next slide, thank you. So uh, we first published these two papers about 10 years ago, in which we argued that, uh, okay, first, uh, uh, animal dosimetry should be abandoned because it poorly predicts a human do the human dose. Then we propose to validate new tracers directly in humans okay, by injecting first a, a single uh, human subject with a low activity and do a whole body scan. The reason was to check whether the biodistribution of the tracer was not unusual. In particular, we wanted to avoid that there was uh, an abnormal disproportionate accumulation in one organ that will give a high organ dose. If that is not the case, then we will proceed with the brain scans to determine whether the radio ligand is worth pursuing. If it is, then we will go back to the dosimetry study, to the dosimetry part and complete the dosimetry studies. Uh, and this is the approach that we have been using for uh, the past 10 years because it was submitted to our Radiation Safety Committee and it was approved. Uh, next slide. Uh, then more recently, a couple of years ago, we published this other paper in which we argued that carbon-11 dosimetry should be abandoned altogether, even for humans. And instead, we would use an average effective dose of 5 microsievert per megabecquerel. Okay, so these were the contents of the letters. Now I'm going to give you the data these recommendations are based on. So next slide. Okay, first, uh, animal studies. Uh, monkeys poorly predict human dosimetry. Uh, in the literature, uh, there are 16 carbon-11 tracers and 21 F18 tracers for which the dosimetry um, of human and monkeys is available. Uh, in terms of effective dose, the monkeys can some predictably under or overestimate the human effective dose with a mean difference of about 30%. The organ dose is Okay, not surprisingly, even less well estimated. But in particular, in only one third of the tracers, the target organ was the same between the two species. So the target organ 
um, is the organ that receives the highest dose. It's more likely the, the limiting factor for the amount of dose you can activity you can give to humans. And uh, in two thirds of the cases, monkeys were not even able to predict which was the target organs, let alone calculate the dose. Um, next slide, thank you. So I, as I was saying, um, in the letter, we spoke only about monkeys because these are the best model for humans with the understanding that if even monkeys cannot es estimate well the dose to humans, there is little chance that mice can. And indeed, uh, I came in contact recently with a German team from Leipzig. Who, they don't have access to monkeys, so they routinely use mice and piglets for human dosimetry. And they have uh, results that are very um, different from the actual human dosimetry. So they are uh, trying to convince the German FDA to let, let them abandon human dosimetry as well. So just so we are not the only ones within this line of thinking that I suspect that there are more. Uh, next slide. So uh, this graph shows you the doses in humans. These are not extrapolated from monkeys. These are human doses of all uh, tracers uh, published in the literature that I could find. So there are uh, 77 carbon 11 tracers and 144 F18 tracers. The average dose for carbon 11 is 5 microsievert per megabecquerel. The average dose for F18 is 20 microsievert per megabecquerel, four times larger. Okay, even without me giving you the value of the standard deviations, you can visually see how the, 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 the carbon 11 doses are more tightly clustered around the mean of 5. Okay. That's why we propose to use uh, an average carbon 11 dose for humans. Okay. One may object that if you, we use an average dose, we may miss uh, some outline value. So if you click once again, there are two arrows popping up. Please click. Uh, okay. So you see there is this very high uh, outline point for carbon 11. Um, which has a dose of about 15 microsievert per megabecquerel. We are talking about something like seven standard deviations above the mean. Okay, there are two things to be said. No, uh, please. So there are two things to be said. The first, uh, even for such a high value, we are practically still uh, one standard deviation below the mean for F18. That is because the dose of carbon 11 is so low that we are always within a safe range. Okay, but second, I will say that um, when you when you find the value that is so outlined, so unique compared to everything else that has been published, you cannot exclude the hypothesis that there were some issues with the data analysis. Okay. Um, this is a standard carbon 11 tracer for a brain receptor, like there are many, and they all share similar biophysical characteristics, uh, molecular weight, uh, lipophilicity, so you do not expect a, a dose that is seven standard deviations away. Okay. And for this tracer in particular, we have animal dosimetry, which shows a standard five microsievert per megapicarel dose. So either Animal dosimetry is so bad that cannot catch something that is seven standard deviations away, or the study needs a replication. And we have a similar case for F18. There is this, uh, the second arrow, there is this very high data point at about 50 microsievert per megapicarel. And this 50 actually is the average between men and women. And the average between men and women is almost a factor of two. There can be sex differences also because you use two different anthropomorphic phantoms, but it's never a factor of almost two. Okay. And then for this tracer, we do have a replication study in humans, which found a more standard dose of about 30 microsievert per megapicarel and no sex differences. So, um, okay, 
even if he can question these outline values on methodological grounds, uh, there is still some variability around the mean of a five microsiever per megavecquerel. So how important is the, this variability? Uh, I would say not very much because knowing whether the dose is slightly above or slightly below five really has no any significant biological meaning. But also, okay, if you go to the next slide, okay, it should not be forgotten that the, the variability is also explained by methodological choices. Okay, whenever you do a dosimetry analysis, you can make arbitrary choices that, that affect the, the numbers that you find reported in the paper. For example, how you draw the region of interest around the organs which organs you use as a, low, a source organs, and for example, the settings of the bladder. So when you, uh, okay, well, uh, when you simulated the dose uh, with an anthropomorphic phantom, you can decide whether the bladder voids at one hour after injection or four hours or one and four hours or never voids. And this can change, of course, that it can change a lot of the dose to the bladder, uh, but also it can change the effective dose because there is more or less radioactivity inside of the body. And there are some papers in the literature which report uh, uh, two sets of values with the different avoiding times, and the results can be significant. They can be in the double digits, which means that um, these could be the values of a completely different tracer if you had chosen a different uh, voiding schedule, for example. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I said before that uh, animal dosimetry is poorly predictive of human dosimetry, but also human dosimetry is poorly predictive of human dosimetry because uh, um, in the literature, there are 18 tracers for which the effective dose was reported by two different teams. Okay, um, mainly because there were two different teams working on the same tracers, and often, unbeknownst to each other, they were working on the dosimetry paper, and then they published the results. And this is a very nice natural experiment to see how reproducible is human dosimetry. And the answer is not very much. Um, the, the difference can be important. Uh, and only three of these 18 tracers, the dose difference was smaller than 10%. If we go to the next slide, uh, this is to remind you that uh, we are not the only ones question the utility of these scans uh, because carbon 11 has already been abandoned somewhere specifically the University Hospital of Amsterdam. Uh, they abandoned both animal and human carbon-11 dosimetry for all tracers, except those that are expected to enter a routine clinical practice. And for F18 tracers in Amsterdam, they use the protocol we outlined here at the NIH, so directly in humans, but with one first whole body scan and then validation of the tracer. So, uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this is the last slide. Our uh, opinions are that we should abandon animal dosimetry for both F18 and carbon 11 because uh, the doses are low for these isotopes, the animals are not a good model, and we, we don't think it's, the, it's a justifiable use of animal research in this case. For F18, we can go directly into humans with um, a single whole body scan and then do the dosimetry after the tracer has been proven valid. And for human carbon-11 dosimetry, we may simply replace uh, with an average dose. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zanati Freganera. Um, we will now take clarifying questions for Dr. Hallett and Dr. Zaganati Raganara. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate if you have a question. You'll find that under the 
um, reactions tab uh, at the very bottom. Now remember to lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you've asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you or the end of your follow-up question with that is all for my questions so we can move to the next panel member. Okay, I see um, we have a question from uh, Terry Gillespie. Hi, thank you. One of my questions is I noticed that they kept saying a healthy patient and I'm a patient advocate and I don't know, I see that most people that need these type of uh, scans or isotopes are not healthy. So I was wondering what they qualify um, as a healthy patient. Uh, Dr. Hallett or Dr. Um, Dr. Zaganata Ferganara, would you like to answer that question? Uh, well, yes, um, indeed, the, the, those imaging analyses are usually performed on healthy patients, and then we assume that uh, the dose estimated in healthy patients, in healthy controls, uh, can be translatable to to patients. And I would say that more, in most cases, uh, this is a reasonable assumption, essentially, when you, and especially when you study diseases like, like uh, the brain. Of course, uh, um, there can be um, differences if there are uh, significant uh, organ failures uh, with, the, with the kidneys or uh, other organs that are supposed to clear the, the tracer away from, from the body. But uh, generally speaking, uh, yes, this is the standard procedure. We, we do a dosimetry is estimated in, in a healthy controls. Yes, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, in a few of our dissymmetry studies, uh, be, because they are um, they are likely to be the, 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 the by distribution and the excretion is likely to be uh, affected. Uh, by uh, the disease, for example, that we have also been asked to do the dissymmetry in patients as well as healthy volunteers. But in any case, the, the dissymmetry number that you get is really only valid as an average over a population. So you you don't expect it to be predictive for an individual person just to give you a, but it's just to give you uh, an average value that you can use to compare different tracers and which tracer you should use if you have a choice. Okay, so my question then is, should the average be adjusted because 90% of the people using this stuff is not healthy anymore? So that means that the uptake to an organ or something else would be more likely, I would think. Uh, yes, potentially, um, but the, it's only one of the variables. I mean, the, 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 a particularly important factor, for example, is if, if a tracer is excreted uh, via the kidneys, um, then patients are encouraged to go to the bathroom to, 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 to avoid, you know, get rid of the, uh, the tracer that's excreted that way. So, um, that can have a really big effect on the on the dose, actually. Um, and, and a lot of tracers are actually not are used only in healthy subjects. If if we're using a tracer to uh, investigate uh, a particular uh, pathway in in the body, you know, a uh, a, a drug which uh, is is really be, a pet tracer, which is really only being used. Um, for basic fundamental research, then it may not be used in patients. Okay, that is all. Thank you very much.
Okay, that question was from uh, uh, Terry. I'm looking for her last name. Gillespie. Gillespie, okay. Uh, Dr. Zong had his hand raised, although he may have, he may have put it down. Do you have a uh, question or comment, Dr. Zong? Yes, thanks, uh, Ping Jishong, again. So my question is to the uh, last speaker. When you, I think maybe you're uh, next to last slide, when you talk about human dosimetry that are also poorly reproducible. So you give the example of, uh, I believe, 18 studies on the same tracer, and they come up with different numbers. Can you um, try to uh, explain what are the reasons if, uh, behind this when people are using the same tracer, perhaps the same uh, uh, subject population as well? I don't know. That could be a major reason. Can you can you ex interpret maybe explain what are the possible reasons people are using different protocols, maybe different populations, different statistical approaches. What are the major reasons behind that? Well, I think uh, I think it's uh, all, uh, I mean, uh, there are multiple reasons uh, at the same time. Surely, um, okay, first, uh, these are different subjects, uh, which can give different time activity curves. And uh, the, the, the the, 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 the way you're drawing the region of interest may be different, and the way the, 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 the organs that you choose can be different. The, the bladder void in time, how they are set up, the, they can be different. Uh, the software that you use can be different. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, the, there is there is not one main reason, but uh, the, 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 this, these dosimetry uh, studies are not well uh, harmonized, in my opinion. I mean, you can find the different approaches in the literature. Um, there are people who collect the urines and measure the urines. There are people who just uh, simply draw a time activity curve around the, the bladder. And this can give some, uh, some variation. Right. Um, maybe I found out about that. How large are those studies in terms of sample size? Yeah, they can be quite small. Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, the vast majority of the studies are be less than 10 subjects. Uh, sometimes you have uh, more for tracers like FDG, which are common, but it, it's not unusual to find uh, um, dosimetry studies uh, with on two subjects or three subjects, and then also can also increase the the, the noise of the uh, the numbers. Great, thank you for their um, for your answer. Okay, Dr. Minton has his ra is hand raised. Yeah, um, Mark Minton, um, Lily, and Radio Pharma and Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals. My question um, is. Uh, Dr. Zanotti, um, I, I found the presentation really compelling, and 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 think this could this type of ex, could lead to acceleration of innovation and finding new traces. Um, but uh, the gal, um, I noticed that. Um, well, could you comment on whether the types of of um, data and your arguments for how to simplify um, doing first in man studies with uh, F eighteen and carbon eleven. Could that be used and extended to the questions that we've been um, given versus with um, gallium and copper? I, I see gallium is also an incredibly important agent for being able to test radiopharmaceuticals. Do is there a would there be an obstacle? Is it a matter of not enough data to conclude this, or is there something intrinsic about not being able to extend the arguments you're making for carbon eleven and F eighteen? to gallium and copper agents on our question. Thank okay. you very much. In principle, um, okay, in principle, the protocol can be uh, apply, applied to other isotopes. I did not 
uh, consider uh, tracers other than uh, isotopes other than carbon 11 or F18 because uh, we work only with uh, carbon 11 and F18. Um, so the, that is the only reason why I limited my presentation to, to these two isotopes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Dr. Darinera has her hand raised. Um, Uni De Raja, University of Michigan. Um, my question is uh, kind of related to the first question um, about the large variability in the data for uh, effective dose coefficients. Um, so my question is, I see some in the plot that was shown uh, in one of the slides, there was some extreme uh, outliers uh, because the F18 values seem to be going from 5 to 50 microsieverts per megabecquerel. Yeah. Um, was there any attempt to identify, for it, at least for those extreme outliers, uh, I would think it would be relatively easy to try to identify whether there was anything specific in their protocol that would have left led to values like 50 microsieverts for megabecquerel. Um, I'm, I'm assuming okay. many of these studies used the Olinda, and uh, there are things like the S1, as you mentioned, the bladder model, but also things like uh, scale, mass scaling for the different organ masses, uh, whether there was anything specific that you could identify. Yeah, correct. I read carefully that study, but I was not able to to, to find the, uh, any obvious reason for this dose. I also tried to um, obtain the original raw data, but uh, they were not available anymore. So because um, okay, the, the study is a bit old, so then I contacted the authors. Um, yeah, so it's unexplained, but uh, I believe that if we were trying to replicate the study, we, we may probably find a different dose. My personal conviction. Thank you. So, I mean, do you think it's reasonable to include those outliers in the discussions? And... I, I think uh, that outlier, I don't think it's reasonable to include. Thank you. Okay, if there are um, no further questions, uh, we will now proceed with the um, FDA presentation, starting with Dr. Danica Blakeu, followed by Dr. Cohen and Dr. Carter. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Donika Pluku, and I'm a medical physicist at the Division of Imaging Radiation Medicine at CEDAR. Uh, I will start my talk by highlighting interest in developing PET imaging drugs and uh, discussing uh, a few radiation dosimetry and, and regulatory aspects. And the main part of my talk is on a dedicated literature review uh, on radiation dosimetry data for PET drugs, and this includes both investigational and approved ones that were analyzed in order to assess the value of non-clinical non dosimetry studies uh, for, uh, these, uh, for PET drug development and to um, evaluate what could be uh, considered as safe administer activity levels for first in human studies with certain new pet drugs um, in the absence of animal-derived human absorbed dose estimates. And I will end by discussing a few aspects, radiation dose dosimetry aspects, 
that may help to put the approach under consideration into, into perspective. Um, Positron emitting radionuclides share some uh, unique characteristics, such as uh, physical, relatively short physical half-lives for measurements of um, fast biological processes, um, and uh, also relying on the 511 keV annihilation photons uh, to produce uh, detectable signals, signals for imaging. Uh, advancements in cancer um, imaging and uh, diagnosis and therapy, uh, as well as management of other diseases, highlight the utility of PET drugs. Uh, in addition, the innovations in PET CT um, imaging uh, technology um, uh, provide uh, continuing and increased research and applications of, of PET drugs. The table shows uh, various PET radionuclides. Uh, this is, these are listed here in increasing physical half-life order. And I have highlighted uh, six radionuclides that are in focus for today and, uh, and for which uh, FDA-approved PET drugs exist. Um, the, the graph shows uh, FDA-approved uh, and spec drugs uh, over the course of uh, 50 years, and uh, please notice an increase of a uh, number of uh, approvals in the recent 10 years. Currently, there are 19 FDA-approved uh, and also about 85 total abbreviated NDAs uh, for pet drugs in the U.S. Uh, earlier today, Dr. Fotinas uh, talked about the Code of Federal Regulations pertinent to radioactive drugs, and this is shown here, um, and this uh, regulation has direct implication on the design of uh, phase one studies, uh, which must obtain data for dosimetric calculations, and therefore IND submissions for new products uh, include those estimates for human organs that are often extrapolated from animal biodistribution data. The extrapolation methods uh, make assumptions on, about the differences in metabolism, anatomy, and biodistribution, be, biodistribution between animals and humans, and uh, these assumptions contribute to uncertainties in predicting radiation dose to human organs. Animal dosimetry studies are important, but there is a tendency to underestimate human organ absorbed dose when extrapolated from animal data, and the differences and associated uncertainties between extrapolated absorbed dose values and those calculated from direct measurements in humans um, are important to consider. Um, the measured uh, percent injected dose per gram in animal tissue is uh, uh, extrapolated to percent injected dose in a human organ, often using the relative organ mass extrapolation method. And uh, this assumes that the metabolism is similar between animals and humans and varies only as a function of organ mass. Uh, Non-clinical studies may provide an estimate for human organ absorbed dose and could also be useful to identify unexpected high uptake in a particular organ before administer, um, administering the drug to, to the patient or to, to a human subject. Uh, the uh, time activity curve can be fit and integrated to obtain what we call uh, reference organ residence time. So once we obtain the residence time in, in, in source organs, one can obtain or calculate the absorbed dose to target organ, organs. And uh, following MERD methodology, um, this uh, requires employing uh, the reference human phantoms. And uh, earlier, Dr. Heller talked about this, how this is calculation is done. Uh, the pictures show a reference human phantoms. Uh, evolution uh, throughout uh, time uh, uh, that were used for, for this type, that are used for, for this calculation. And uh, this methodology is appropriate in diagnostic nuclear medicine where we do calculation based on reference uh, representative of, of a general population, not for a single patient. 
So, uh, this slide highlights current FDA recommendations on non-clinical dosimetry studies for new pet drug development. Investigators are encouraged to contact FDA early and recommendations are generally provided upon review of pre-IND submissions and IND opening protocols. Uh, when plans to conduct or results of animal biodistribution and dosimetry studies are being reviewed or are reviewed. The submissions may also include human organ dose estimates. And I want to highlight here that uh, currently the, uh, the review of dosimetry data provided in the pre-IND and IND submissions of new pet drugs is performed on a case-by-case -case basis as uh, Dr. Potinos uh, also explained, and the review issues generally include limitations on animal-to-human extrapolation and recommendations on planning uh, and design of animal biodistribution studies and on the design of clinical dosimetry studies. Future recommendations will involve an approach to compare planned administered activity for first in human studies with new pet drugs or the maximum protocol specific, uh, specified administer activity covering the pre-phase one dosimetry cohort. Uh, so basically comparing the planned administer activity of in, in the submission uh, of the IND op opening protocol with mean uh, administered activity values that have been derived from uh, approved drugs for each of these six pet radionuclides shown on the slide. And uh, this, is, this uh, is in the absence of animal-derived radiation dose estimates. So in other words, the approach under consideration involves administered activity values for first in human studies that may allow foregoing animal biodistribution studies. And I will describe this approach in more detail after I talk about how these values were determined. Uh, one of the early and uh, few studies that uh, looked at the value of uh, non-clinical dosimetry studies is the study by, uh, by the Oak Ridge in, uh, published in Oak Ridge Symposium by Sparks and Idoan. And uh, in this study, the authors looked at the um, uh, various extrapolation techniques to predict residence time in humans using both non-clinical and clinical data uh, for several extrapolation methods such as relative organ mass and physiological time or a combination of the two. And uh, the residence times or what we actually call time integrated activity coefficients uh, for source organs were calculated using animal and human data and ratios of animal derived versus human measures were plotted for each extrapolation method. In these uh, histograms, you see distribution of these ratios uh, for each uh, extrapolation method, and one can look at the geometric mean of these distributions uh, being less than one, so, uh, so basically, basically indicating the tendency to underestimate the residence time in human organs when, uh, when calculating from uh, animal distribution studies or dosimetry studies. Uh, uh, also, in this study, the physiological time extrapolation had uh, an, improvement, an improvement on this, on this ratio. However, the data reviewed in this study were limited, so there is, there is a need to repeat such studies with all available clinical experience with pet drugs that we have now. Um, studies conducted by colleagues at NIH, uh, Dr. Zanotti Fergonara talked about this, uh, also showed that, that were shown earlier in the previous talk. Uh, they, uh, they looked at the, uh, performed the review of dosimetry um, data of carbon-11 and F18 uh, drugs and the relative radiation profile between them. Uh, Dr. Zanotti talked in detail about uh, observed var variability in those estimates and uh, explained uh, what could these, the variabilities be attributed to. Uh, 
Other studies uh, that we found in literature uh, were wrote about strengths and weaknesses of various extrapolation methods uh, um, for, for these calculations and factors affecting animal to human extrapolation. Um, specifically for murine species, several factors have been reported to cause discrepancies between mouse and human derived organ absorbed doses. And there is a need for standardization in, in uh, dosimetry methodology and reporting um, in, in order to ensure uh, reproducibility of results. A more recent study looked at the gallium-68 radio-labeled macromolecules uh, and uh, compared five extrapolation methods and uh, suggested that the best uh, approximation of the actual human dosimetry uh, was provided by the method which uh, applied a metabolic scaling to the, to the murine data. So these considerations prompted FDA to uh, reevaluate the utility of animal dosimetry studies and, and come up with recommendations to streamline the assessment of the radiation safety of pet drugs. And in order to determine administrativity levels for uh, first in human studies that may allow foregoing animal dosimetry studies, we followed this approach. First, we decided to leverage findings for the safety of approved drugs, approved pet drugs, when administered at the A levels specified on the drug label. And in the table, you can see all FDA-approved pet drugs, along with uh, indications for adult patients and recommended administer activity uh, on, the, on the prescribing information. Secondly, a systematic review of human dosimetry estimates of pet drugs derived from uh, both non-clinical and clinical dosimetry studies was also conducted and collected dosimetry data were analyzed. So in this literature review, uh, articles were selected uh, uh, that articles were selected with reported human organ radiation uh, dose estimates from both human and, and, and hu uh, animal and human studies. Um, and these were uh, calculated according to MERD or related methodology. Specifically, we looked at the organ absorbed dose uh, values and whole body effective dose uh, or uh, effective dose coefficients. For, for the radionuclides or drugs or radio labeled with these PET radionuclides. In addition, we looked, we looked at the proportion of published studies with administered activity above the mean administered activity from uh, drug labels or prescribing information of approved drugs, and we did this in order to evaluate the range of administered activity values in the available clinical data. So uh, dosimetry data from a total of 322 PET uh, drugs were analyzed, um, and this includes both investigation and approved ones. The left and right figures show the, uh, the uh, whole body effective dose coefficient and organ absorbed dose, dose coefficients. Um, actually, the maximum organ absorbed dose coefficients for the um, for both animal derived and human measured data in these studies. And you can see the gray and black uh, data points uh, respectively. Overall, we observed that animal studies provided close estimates to values derived from human studies. And also the variability in those estimates derived from clinical studies was lower for the majority of the studies shown. The organs exhibiting uh, maximum organ dose coefficients were generally identified as the organs of excretion, such as the kidneys, uh, urinary bladder, and not the more radiosensitive organs, such as the blood forming, uh, lens of the eye, or the reproductive organs. Um, we calculated the whole body effective dose and maximum organ absorbed dose values by using the dose coefficients and the average study AA, so uh, administrative activity over all subjects in, in the study. 
and this is what is shown on these two figures. Um, you can see that uh, the whole body effective dose values were less than 20 millisieverts for uh, F18, gallium 68, um, uh, and copper 64, and less than 10 millisieverts for the shorter lived radionuclides such as carbon 11 and the rest. And this is well below the uh, generally accepted uh, whole body dose limit of 30 millisieverts. Figure four shows the maximum organ absorbed dose values in milligray, uh, and one can look at the proportion of the studies with maximum organ absorbed dose uh, above 50 milligray or millisievert, as this is generally accepted as the organ absorbed dose threshold um, uh, for, for the less uh, radiosensitive organs. And this proportion uh, range from 1 to 26 percent for the majority of, of, the, of the cases and about 50 percent for copper 64. Overall, drugs labeled with these PET radionuclides um, have a relatively short, uh, safe radiation profile. The lower radiation profile of these six radionuclides that are in focus today is clear when, if we compare uh, effective dose estimates to those reported in, in uh, zirconium-89 or ion-24 um, studies. And the radionuclides are listed in this figure in increasing physical half-life order, starting with rubidium-82 and up to copper-64. I separated here zirconium-89 and ion-24, and you can see that the effective dose um, estimates are about 10 to 15 uh, times uh, higher for the longer-lived uh, radionuclides. Uh, and there is less variability in those estimates for the shorter-lived ones. I would like to note that FDA does not have defined thresholds uh, that limit the organ absorbed dose or whole body effective dose for diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals studied under an IND application. However, the CFR uh, code, uh, Title 21, Part 361, outlines upper radiation dose limits to individual organs and the whole body for radioactive drugs studied under an uh, institutional RDRC protocol for adult subjects. And these organ absorbed dose limits are shown in this slide for both single dose administration and annual total dose commitment, commitments. So um, uh, in this table, I uh, wanted to compare the mean administered activity values or actually the statistics of administered activity values in the available clinical studies published in literature with the mean of the recommended administered activity from the approved uh, drug labels. And, and you can see that um, this is uh, shown here in the, in the red column. Combining the clinical dosimetry experience for both investigational and approved drugs, um, the approach under consideration for today's meeting is to use the calculated mean AA or administer activity of approved drugs for each radionuclide. Um, so basically the mean of the recommended AA for first in human studies with new investigational pet drugs to generally allow the investigator to forego animal radiation dosimetry studies. And I wanted to compare the proportion of uh, studies with reported uh, administer activity that exceed the values in the red column. And this range uh, ranges from 30 to 75 percent, um, and with the highest being the copper 64 studies. Here I excluded uh, uh, and thir uh, nitrogen 13 because there is only one uh, approved drug. So also uh, what is uh, relevant is to compare actually the dose estimates for the approved drugs and the uh, clinical studies, uh, especially the studies with AA that or administer activity uh, higher than the mean administer activity from the drug labels. And you can see that 
there is a slight difference in effective dose estimates between the two. So in the left, uh, this, this is the mean effective dose for approved drugs. On the right, you have the mean effective dose for uh, other available clinical studies. And uh, there is a slight difference between published and, 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 and the approved drugs. Uh, a similar comparison can be done in terms of organ absorbed dose estimate and actually in terms of the maximum organ uh, absorbed dose values as this organ is uh, generally the critical organ. So the maximum organ uh, absorbed dose of the approved drugs are lower than the absorbed dose estimates of published studies with uh, administered activity higher than the mean AA from the, from the approved drug labels. And the largest, di largest difference here, uh, more than a factor of two, is for copper 64. So generally, comparing radiation dose estimates for studies with administered activity higher than this mean AA values um, shows that reducing administered activity at the mean drug label AA level generally serves to reduce radiation dose and may allow for reasonable calculation to ensure the safety of first in human subjects pending availability of uh, required clinical dosimetry data. To put this approach under consideration um, into perspective, it helps to look at conservative approaches to determine upper uh, administrative activity limits for human dosimetry studies. So going back to the biological endpoint of performing radiation dosimetry in diagnostic nuclear medicine. We are talking about cancer risk of cancer re reduction, uh, sorry, risk of cancer induction later in life, which is a stochastic effect. The input data come from measured time activity and reference source organs. Calculation involves MERD uh, methodology and reference human phantoms and models that relate a dose to risk. In addition, one should consider the added uh, dose from CT scanning um, um, when evaluating the, uh, the radiation safety or the total uh, effective dose. CT dose value is shown here for um, a typical diagnostic F18 FDG PET CT imaging. So the optimal administer activity in diagnostic imaging is the lowest uh, activity that uh, to achieve uh, the the imaging objective, which is a reliable diagnosis. So we uh, we try to balance image quality with risk due to radiation exposure. Uh, in the context of this biological effect, so the radiation induced risk, and in order to simulate a bad case radiation dose scenario. We sought to calculate the risk associated with a high uh, absorbed dose delivered to a single organ and clearance by uh, and clearance of the activity by uh, physical decay only and uh, uh, upon administration of a pet drug. So the target organ cancer risk in the in this case the kidneys. Um, uh, is calculated or estimated for an 18-year-old female subject um, using absorbed dose cal calculated from for this hypothetical scenario for each radionuclide, um, and the calculation involves or, or used um, the uh, NCI red red tool for radiation risk, and the, so the relative risk is expressed in risk index. This is the ratio of uh, radiation induced risk versus the natural incidence of cancer. The plot uh, in the bottom shows risk in death calcula calculated for four radionuclides listed in increasing physical half life order. Um, I'm sorry, it's not uh, because carbon 11 is not after F18, but uh, four radionuclides shows shown here. And the um, a risk index for uh, F any F18, gallium 68, and copper 64 were about 1.3, 2, and 4 times higher than the risk index for F18 FDG, typical uh, scan, uh, respectively. For carbon 11, this risk index is uh, about 3 times smaller than the risk from 
F18 FDG, uh, typical uh, imaging or risk associated with a typical administration for, for an F18 FDG scan. Other studies in literature perform simulations for carbon-11 label compounds to estimate the administered activity level that would not exceed 50 millisieverts to an individual organ. The purpose is to rule out the possibility of radioactivity accumulation in a single organ when the biodistribution is unknown. And in this study, Gatli uh, calculated an upper limit of 130 megabecquerel or 3.45 millicurie, uh, and suggested to be used in performing a preliminary study in humans without reaching this organ uh, absorbed dose limit. This approach allows also assessment of a worst case scenario, so activity accumulation in a single radiosensitive organ in order to conservatively plan initial human PET studies. Other uh, ways to conservatively, conservatively determine the, a, the maximum AA for human subjects or for human studies with a new PET drug could be to use the maximum reported uh, absorbed dose uh, to, uh, in the clinical studies and RDRC absorbed dose thresholds and such calculations are also available in the studies published by Zanotti Fregonara. It must be noted that in FDA experience with clinical dosimetry data of PET drugs, such case scenarios have, have not been observed. So this flowchart helps to understand the current recommendations for non-clinical and clinical dosimetry studies and what would change or the future state if the approach under consideration is implemented in the pre-IND and IND submission review for new PET drugs. So in the current state, the uh, sub, uh, available uh, animal dosimetry or uh, available dosimetry data in the, in the submitted protocols are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis to, um, to decide uh, that the study is safe to proceed from a radiation safety perspective or to recommend collection of phase one clinical dosimetry data. Uh, in, in, the, in the future or in the going forward, if the approach under consideration of so the mean administered activity values from approved drugs are utilized, then in the absence of drug-specific animal dosimetry data, if the maximum protocol-specified administered activity covering the pre-phase one dosimetry cohort is less than or equal to the corresponding a uh, or mean A values for pet uh, for pet drugs approved approved as of today, and will involve um, a study population with a similar risk profile. Then the clinical data uh, can be considered uh, to have uh, to allow a reasonable calculation of uh, absorbed dose and may generally. Uh, be sufficient to find the corresponding portions of the protocol safe to proceed from a radiation safety perspective. Conversely, if the, uh, the sufficiency of the drug specific, specific animal dosimetry should continue to be reviewed on a case by case basis, if the maximum protocol specified administered activity covering the pre phase one dosimetry cohort exceeds the corresponding. Uh, AA for pet drugs approved, uh, approved as of today, uh, or if the study population is notably dissimilar in terms of radiation risk. To illustrate this, I included some simple examples to, uh, for this implementation. So if the planned AA for a first in human study with a new pet drug, uh, for example, a new F18 uh, drug, um, uh, if the planned AA is about 185 megabecquerel, megabecquerel or 5 millicurie, which is less than a mean administered activity from all approved F18 uh, PET drugs, uh, 8 millicurie, then uh, general, the study may be found generally safe to proceed from radiation safety perspective uh, without uh, conducting animal uh, biodistribution studies. If no, so if the planned AA is higher than this, um, than, than the mean AA value from a, approved bed drugs, 
then um, the case-by-case -case IMD review will continue and there may be potential need to collect animal dosimetry data. Uh, further recommendations for collection of clinical dosimetry data would be to start with an administrative activity uh, which is less than this mean recommended AA. And uh, so basically uh, activity, uh, lower in, uh, administrative activities can start uh, by, by administration in a single human subject. Uh, and then um, activity escalation rules can be considered depending on the imaging and clinical dosimetry results. Uh, and uh, uh, if the radion ligand is worth pursuing, then collection of phase one clinical dosimetry data can proceed in a similar way, depending on the starting administer activity in the protocol. Activity de-escalation rules can also be considered depending on the imaging and initial uh, clinical dosimetry results. So to summarize, I, uh, uh, liter uh, our literature review provided a previously unavailable collection of radiation dosimetry data for pet drugs derived from both non-clinical and clinical studies, which supplements previous reviews for carbon-11 and F18 drugs and provides all published data for other pet radionuclides. The approach under consideration is to use the mean administrative activity from uh, prescribing information or, or drug labels containing these six, six radionuclides in radiation safety review of first in human studies. And this was developed after analyzing all available clinical dosimetry data from both FDA approved and investigational PET drugs. The issues for discussion are to uh, discuss sufficiency of review dosimeter data and discuss reasonableness of uh, this approach under consideration. Thank you for your attention and I would like to take this opportunity to thank my uh, FDA colleagues for the hard work and the invaluable discussion. Thank you, Dr. Pleku. We will now proceed with the presentation from Dr. Cohen. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Jonathan Cohen and as part of uh, the FDA's um, presentation uh, at this AC, I would like to speak about non-clinical perspective on animal dissymmetry studies that support um, diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals or pet drugs for regulatory submissions. Next slide. So the focus of this presentation is to provide a pharmacology and toxicology assessment on the utility of non-clinical biodistribution and dissymmetry studies in animals that support diagnostic radiopharmaceuticals or pet drugs, IND submissions. So when I refer to pet drugs, I, my intent is to both include um, small molecules as well as biologics. And the following points that I'm going to make are not intended to apply to therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals. So this assessment is based upon current federal regulations as well as FDA guidance documents that apply to pet drugs and the principles to reduce, refine, and replace animal use. The research. So specifically, there are three questions. So what non-clinical and clinical data can be relied upon to support development of pet drugs? Can sponsors optimize their non-clinical studies to ensure the efficiency of clinical development without jeopardizing safety for first in human studies? And last, can pet drug safety be predicted by the radionuclide properties? Next slide. The current uh, regulations allow for a risk-benefit assessment on the non-clinical study requirements. As an example, pet drugs encompass a very diverse set of targets, patient populations, as well as indications. So, and our recommendations are based upon the totality of this information. There are several guidance documents that are, um, support the development of pet drugs. This includes ICHM3R2, the exploratory IND guidance, as well as the more recent microdose guidance. And they describe general uh, studies that are recommended to support the safety of first and human INDs for uh, these uh, pet drugs. So while I mentioned that um, the guidance documents are recommendations, they're based upon the agency's current thinking, there are federal regulatory requirements that specifies that for radiopharmaceuticals, 
that there must be sufficient data from animal or human studies to allow a reasonable calculation of the radiation absorbed dose. And for the NDAs and BLAs, then it must be an evaluation of the safety for the drugs and biologics, and include, that's included in the label, labeling and prescribing information. Next slide. I want to briefly comment on two non-clinical guidances, ICHM3R2 and the microdose guidance, and it's how they apply to non-clinical biodistribution and dosimetry studies. So the vast majority of these PET drugs are administered at microdose levels, so either not more than 100 micrograms for small molecules or 30 nanomoles for protein products or biologics. The number of recommended studies that are to support the pharmacology, which generally include in vivo and in vitro characterization, binding studies, off-target profiling, as well as studies to determine the PK properties and dosimetry studies. The main thrust of these studies is that they demonstrate evidence that the radio labeling doesn't significantly alter the uh, pharm pharmacology of the uh, ligand. So next slide. So as I mentioned, I want to draw a distinction between current regulatory standards for products that are indicated as diagnostics and radiotherapeutics. Both products, uh, primary pharmacology studies, as mentioned, in vitro and in vivo characterization, are recommended to demonstrate evidence that the radio labeling doesn't alter their pharmacodynamic properties. However, for diagnostics, biodistribution and dosimetry studies are recommended to inform on their target organ uptake. Safety pharmacology studies are generally not needed. For therapeutics, the biodistribution studies are needed to inform on human dose selection of the radiotherapeutic and the safety pharmacology endpoints can generally be included either in the biodistribution, dosimetry, or toxicity studies. Pharmacokinetic information in the test species is important in providing information about the systemic exposure and the half-life of the drug, as well as inform other information that's relevant to potential drug-drug interactions. Toxicity studies, uh, the requirements of those are based upon the called mass dose, as well as the frequency of dosing. Next slide. I want to make a few additional points regarding uh, non-clinical biodistribution studies, particularly the significance of them. They, uh, these studies are demonstrate target organ uptake, for example, uh, uptake into the central nervous system. Uh, they can include animal disease models to support the mechanism of action of the pet drug. And more importantly, they also provide information on the pet drug stability, its metabolism, as well as its route of elimination. They can provide information that supports the clinical pet imaging, such as the imaging time window post-dose, as well as signal the background noise. The extent of these studies is also dependent upon the marketing intent, as well as the patient numbers. Next slide. The so primary pharmacology and proof of concept studies support safety and clinical efficacy of these first in human clinical studies. There's value for the pharmacodynamic and biodistribution studies that characterize new radial ligands. We also acknowledge that there's differences between animal and human radiation absorbed dose, and sponsors uh, will frequently consider other data sources in the absence of animal dosimetry studies, and this is on a case-by-case -case basis. So next slide. So we can consider a weight of evidence approach to evaluate pet drugs and the radiation absorbed dose. For example, the radionuclide half-life and biological half-life for small molecules and peptides are generally less than 24 hours. This contrasts with monoclonal antibodies that have half-lives of several days and may be labeled with either zirconium-89 or iodine-124. The longer the half-life will result in greater exposure and radiation risk. Another consideration is the range of administered activities for short-lived radioisotopes, such as C11, F18, as well as the effective dose. There should be justification provided for the organ and effective dose levels. And last, the proposed clinical dose should be as low as reasonably achievable. Next slide. To summarize, animal biodistribution studies are of value for their contribution to our understanding pet drug mechanism of action, pharmacogenetics, as well as absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Uh, it's an ongoing evaluation on the need for these animal dosimetry studies to support first in human pet drugs. And the weight of evidence approach is, should be applied on a case-by-case basis and consider the totality of evidence. And last, we're considering the streamlined approach for first in human studies of pet drugs. Next slide. I have uh, here, just uh, for reference, some guidance documents that I referred to in this short presentation. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Cohen. Uh, we'll now proceed with a presentation from Dr. Carter. Good afternoon. My name is Samantha Cotter, and I'm a safety evaluator in the Division of Pharmacovigilance within the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology. Today, I'm going to provide a brief overview of post-marketing drug safety and surveillance activities conducted by our division for all marketed products, including but not limited to drugs used for PET imaging procedures. Next slide. To better understand the safety profile of marketed products as used in the real world, FDA relies upon clinicians and the public to report safety concerns. During this presentation, we will review how to report adverse events to FDA, discuss how the agency uses adverse event reporting information to monitor the safety of marketed products discuss the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System, also known as FAERS, discuss FAERS reporting trends for pet drugs, and provide examples of pet drug safety labeling, changes, and communications. Next slide. Safety is evaluated throughout the life cycle of approved products. Prior to drug approval, as noted on the left-hand side of the figure, safety is evaluated during the phase one to phase three clinical trials in conjunction with dosage and efficacy evaluation. Following drug approval, on the right-hand side of the figure, safety surveillance continues in the post-marketing setting, incorporating a variety of data sources. A critical part of the overall safety evaluation whether prior to or following product approval, is the implementation of strategies and actions to minimize the risk identified regarding safety concerns. Following completion of the phase one through phase three trials, if FDA concludes that the risk benefit balance is positive, as noted in the yellow diamond on the figure, a determination may be made to approve the drug product. And although pre-marketing clinical trials are the gold standard to determine safety and efficacy at the time of drug approval, all trials have limitations. One important limitation of pre-marketing clinical trials is the size of the population that is studied. These trials are generally smaller than the size of the population that would be exposed to the product under real world conditions. These phase one through three trials are adequate to characterize events that happen frequently. However, rare events may not be observed. Accordingly, FDA continues pharmacovigilance monitoring of drug products through case level review and in some cases, larger post-approval epidemiologic studies. Next slide. FDA uses several data sources to identify and evaluate safety concerns, one of which is the FDA Adverse Event Reporting System. Other key data sources include, but are not limited to the following, periodic adverse drug experience reports from drug manufacturers, case reports and studies in the published medical literature, and outside inquiries such as citizens' petitions or interactions with foreign regulatory agencies. When we identify new safety concerns, FDA works with the applicants to update prescribing information or to communicate directly to healthcare professionals or consumers to share new safety information. Next slide. Two pathways exist for patients, consumers, and healthcare professionals to report a suspected adverse event to FDA. First, on the left-hand side of the figure, these post-marketing reports can be submitted directly through FDA's MedWatch program. Alternatively, 
on the right-hand side of the figure, reports can be submitted to the product manufacturer, who is then required to submit all such reports to FDA. It is through this route that the vast majority of reports are received and entered into the FAERS database. Next slide. To directly submit a report to MedWatch, the FDA's Medical Product Safety Reporting Program, health professionals, patients, and consumers can utilize the FDA MedWatch website and directly submit reports via the internet or the form can be downloaded, completed, and sent back to the agency by mail, email, or fax. Next slide. So how does FDA use these FAERS reports? Pharmacovigilance staff review reports in addition to other data sources like the medical literature to identify new safety concerns with a product. Screening of cumulative adverse event reports from multiple sources and of both serious and non-serious outcomes is an approach to better understand the post-marketing safety profile of products. We consult the prescribing information of the product to determine if an event reported is already known or contains new safety information. If a new signal is identified, we work with the appropriate division, in this case, the Division of Imaging and Radiation Medicine, to open a newly identified safety signal, also referred to as a NIS. If we determine that a new safety concern should be labeled or communicated to the public, then we work to make that happen. Next slide. This chart is adapted from the FAERS public dashboard, displaying all report types, direct, expedited, and periodic, received by FDA for drugs and therapeutic biologic products. Here, we present the adverse event reports and FAERS for all products on the left y-axis, as noted by the red trend line, and for approved pet drugs on the right y-axis, as noted by the green trend line. Please note that the left axis is in millions and the right axis is in hundreds. Data presented in this figure covers the years of 2002 when the first pet drug adverse event report was received by FDA through the end of 2022. It is important to note that FDA initially began receiving adverse event reports in 1968, and although the years 1968 through 2002 are not presented in this chart, the reports from these years are represented in the total number for all product reports and fares, tallying approximately 26 million through 2022, as noted in the footnote. In contrast to the number for all products reports in the FAERS database, there are only 562 reports through the end of 2022 for pet drugs. As these products are not being used to induce a clinical effect, rather for diagnostic purposes, it is not surprising that the safety issues might be infrequently reported for these drugs. The first pet drug to be approved by FDA was in the 1970s. Additional drugs have been approved over the years, with the most recent being approved earlier this year in 2023. You can see in the chart a rise in the number of reports for pet drugs in 2018 on the green trend line which based on a separate analysis of this data correlates with the time following the 2016 approval of gallium dotatate GA68 and flucyclovine F18. We again see a rise in the number of reports between 2021 and 2022, which also correlates with the 2020 and 2021 approvals of five pet drugs. Next slide. 
On this slide, we give an overview of some of the more recent safety-related labeling changes, also referred to as SRLCs, that have been communicated to the public by FDA. Of these, the Division of Pharmacovigilance contributed to the hypersensitivity reactions, SRLC, identified with the radio-labeled dotatate pet drugs in 2021. Next slide. FDA has many pathways to communicate safety information to the public, and this slide only provides a few that may be utilized. First, on the left-hand side, we have an image of the FAIR's public dashboard. The dashboard is a highly interactive web table that allows the public to query FAIR's data. While the FAIR's public dashboard offers opportunity to search adverse event reports received by FDA, there remain limitations to the data. These include duplicate and incomplete reports existing in the system, the fact that the existence of a report does not establish causation, information in reports has not been verified, and an incident rate cannot be established with the reports. In the center of the slide, we see a snapshot of the web posting, potential signals of serious risks, new safety information identified by FAIRS. Other forms of communication include updates to prescribing information or product labeling, as shown in the upper right-hand side, and also drug safety communications to the public and healthcare professionals as pictured in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Next slide. So in summary, FDA continues to monitor all products, including but not limited to pet drugs, throughout the life cycle, utilizing various pharmacovigilance and epidemiologic data sources in an attempt to ensure that the benefit-risk balance of a product continues to remain favorable during the post-marketing phase of its life cycle. Voluntary reporting of adverse event data associated with drug products by healthcare professionals and patients is an important activity to support the safe use of FDA-approved drug products. We encourage continued reporting of drug-related adverse events, including adverse events from pet drugs through the MedWatch program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kata. Please pull up slide five. We will now take clarifying questions for the FDA presenters. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate you have a question. And remember to lower, the, lower your hand by clicking the raise hand icon again after you have asked your question. When acknowledged, please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. Um, if you wish to wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. Finally, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you in the end of your follow-up question with that is all for my questions. So we can move on to the next presenter. I see that Dr. Bolch has his hand up. Dr. Bolch. Yes, uh, West Falls University Thornton. I have a question for the first speaker, Dr. Becko. Um, and my, my question is simply on your tables for absorbed dose. Um, were those any um, organ, source organ with highest activity, or was there some factoring in of radio sensitivity? Uh, could, could it have been any organ in the body, or, or was, was there a subset of uh, radio sensitive organs that were part of that table? Uh, yes, thank you for that question, Dr. Bolch. Um, the, the organ absorbed those estimates on the table are uh, the estimates that are reported in the studies 
So as calculated, uh, either the Zubiri calculations, and those, what I showed were the maximum organ observed dose in the, in the studies, in the collected studies. So uh, the uh, radiosensitivity is not included, uh, it is included in, in, in effective dose estimates. Uh, but, um, and I mentioned that the organs that uh, exhibiting maximum organ dose values in the majority of, of the studies that we collected were usually the organs of excretion for, okay. for most of the cases uh, that we collect, the studies that we analyzed, not the more radiosensitive organs. And these were as reported in the, in the published data. Okay. Thank you, Burton. Thank you very much. I have a quick, uh, and thank you also for introducing the risk index. Um, I just wanted to alert uh, the uh, individuals that uh, some work between the University of Florida and Memorial Sloan Kettering, we have a pending paper that's been accepted in medical physics uh, that is going to address the, the, the concept of risk index. And there is a comprehensive, part of that article is a comprehensive uh, uh, annex that goes through all different radionuclides, reference phantoms, and looks at effective dose, detriment, uh, uh, detriment weighted dose, risk index, lifetime of trivial risk, uh, it, I, it should be uh, informative uh, in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you for letting us know. Okay, Dr. Jacobs had a, uh, her hand up. Yes. Um, it seems to me, listening to the first presentation, that several different approaches to what could be a cutoff were evaluated from approved agents you know, using the package insert, from published data, from uh, using the RDRC 50 millisieverts limit. Uh, it was unclear to me how those compare with each other and why, what was the trade-off discussions between using one type or another. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this question is clear, but it seems there's several different ways that this could be looked at, and I, I didn't get a sense of the pros and cons of each method. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jacobs, for the question. Um, you're correct. Uh, so I uh, I described uh, the approach we followed to uh, come up with a cutoff mean AA values, and the approach is to uh, 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 look at the approved drug label, uh, recommended administrative activity levels. Uh, in addition to that, we looked at all the available clinical studies with all, all these pet or and drugs in order to uh, evaluate the, the vari variability in, in those estimates in reported dosimetry data and put these mean AA values in, in, in perspective. The um, additional approaches that, I, that were included in my later slides um, were not part of that determination uh, in particular, but were considered as bad or worst case scenarios so we can have a perspective in, in, in uh, this um, uh, so, uh, recommendations for these mean A values and uh, and also um, uh, calculations of relative radiation risk um, in 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 uh, available clinical studies um, and um, but also uh, wanted to express uh, to, to mention that FDA has not had an experience uh, has not observed such scenarios in the IND submission review of, of, avail of pet drugs. So those additional approaches were to supplement my discussion, so to say, and to put things in perspective, but not used to calculate the, the cutoff. So the cutoff was primarily based on the approved pet drugs um, perhaps with the consideration that those have had much more uh, general exposure in the patient pop in diverse patient populations, as a 
kind of a a worst case or mainly on the uh, on the uh, findings of the safety of the uh, approved pet drugs thank you okay uh, dr larson has his hand raised yes thank you very much this is a question for dr cotter thank you very much for that very illuminating presentation about fares. I wanted to ask about the follow-up on these uh, interesting findings a bit more. I, I know you were careful to point out that mechanism of action and other things was not intrinsically in the data or even the incidents, but is there a way that FDA uh, will follow up on this data? For example, uh, with with FDG, I didn't notice very many remarks on uh, on on adverse reactions. I mean, and of course, millions of scans are done every year with FDG. Whereas with the gallium dotate, there was a rather significant uh, signal. So, can you comment on how you follow up on this and whether? Whether this, uh, whether there's any sort of denominator to these uh, findings. Once again, thank you very much for your comments. Thank you very much for your question. Um, so, regarding uh, um, just first of note um, with FDG, since it's been on the market longer, we have a tendency to see a drop in the number of reports that are submitted to um, the agency, um, and that's probably why we saw the recent spike in the gallium dotatate um, and the flucyclovine product. Um, if we do receive reports, we definitely have the ability to reach out to the um, individual that submitted the report, but we realize that, um, you know, that number of 562 compared to the 26 million uh, appears on the, you know, it's uh, of a lower number, but we that that's why we're continuously going through the medical literature, um, looking at um, information that's coming in from the manufacturers. Um, we try to cast a, a wide net of our um, looking at uh, different data sources because uh, we do acknowledge that um, you know the, the numbers are on the smaller side um, but that I also think is um, part of the reason for us giving the presentation is to make um, individuals in the community and healthcare providers aware that we really take those reports you know seriously um, so, but uh, in regards to following up, we definitely um, have the ability to reach out to the individual that submitted the report. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Jacobs had a question. Oh, maybe not. I don't see any more hands raised. Anyone else have a question? Uh, yes, so I, I see. I see a bunch of hands raised now. Uh, Dr. Nedro, hi. Um, I have a question for Drs. Uh, Pleku and Cohen, uh, particularly um, about the microdosing and the mean administrative um, activity uh, for copper sixty four as copper 64's FDA-approved agent, Delta Tate is a peptide-based agent and has a lower molecular weight. Um, will that mean activity also be recommended for agents that are not maybe in an antibody, but of a higher molecular weight, ranging from like 20 to 80 or up to an antibody for kilodaltons? Or is that going to be relying only on the microdosing of less than 30 nanomolars for protein-based agents? Thank you. 
question. Dr. Nedro, uh, thank you for the question. If you can clarify, um, the question is about microdosing uh, of, partic in particular, uh, copper 64 radio pharmaceuticals? Uh, proposed um, on your talk, which was very nice, uh, that the mean uh, administered activity of the current FDA approved agents would be um, suggested level to start. Uh, but for copper 64, the agent is uh, dotatate, which has a low molecular weight, and the pharmacokinetics of peptides vary um, drastically different than something of a higher molecular weight. And copper 64's longer half-life would allow you um, pet agents that might be a little bit heavier or have a higher molecular weight, um, maybe not as high as an antibody. But for the recommended um, uh, administered activity, the mean value, would that be applied um, to all copper 64 based, uh, based pet agents, or would there be a molecular uh, weight cutoff that they would need to be a more individual evaluation by the FDA? Hi, that's a really good question because uh, copper 64 with a half-life of around 12 hours, you know, it's suitable for labeling both peptides and antibodies. Um, and you know, as far as um, the differences in the PK, certainly small peptides will have a, will be a limit, presumably eliminated a lot faster than you know larger, uh, whether they be uh, uh, modified antibodies or antibodies themselves. And that could definitely affect the um, the, uh, exposure, radiation exposure. And I don't, my understanding is that we have not actually delved in to look at that detail, it's, but it's likely that that would actually tip the balance in terms of what we would say would go with a, an approach under a certain limit versus over a certain limit because the, the characteristics would be different. And we only, there's only one currently FDA approved product that's Copper 64, which is the TechNet. Thank you. Um, I also want to mention that the approach under consideration is the same for the six radionuclides. And uh, even though we did look uh, in more, um, we did a more uh, small, um, small group analysis uh, in a radio labeled molecular, molecular type, and that will be in um, a literature review, which we aim to publish later, uh, the approach under consideration doesn't include uh, those uh, aspects uh, for the radionuclides. So it's it's uniform for 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 the six radionuclides. Okay, I have five other panel members who have their hands raised, so. Um, I'm going to try to move along a little bit more qu quickly. Uh, Dr. Dewey, is your uh... Yes, uh, this question is for Dr. Piklu, uh, the first speaker. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My question is regarding uh, whether, some, whether the bone marrow was uh, considered in any of these studies uh, when reporting the organ absorbed doses. Uh, thank you, Dr. Levaraja, for the question. Um, in the studies, uh, we identified the maximum organ of uh, the organ with maximum absorbed dose, and that was not uh, the bone marrow. The, the, it was generally the organs of excretion. So, bone marrow. I mean, the absorbed dose estimates were were for all organs were considered in the collective uh, dosimetry data, but not, um, but this was not the maximum organ, uh, uh, the organ with maximum absorbed dose. However, some, some of the studies did inclu include the dose to bone marrow. Is that what you're saying? Yes, because we collected all the reported dosimetry estimates. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, actually, I have one other quick question. Um, so you also mentioned that there was much higher variability in the animal data compared with human data. Um, do you think this that is because of the variability in, because you mentioned there were multiple different methods for extrapolation from animals to human studies? Would that have been a reason for the higher variability that you saw with the animal data compared with the human data? 
uh, I think uh, it it may be one of the reasons, and probably there is more uh, uh, systematic uncertainties uh, with uh, doing uh, performing animal pet distribution studies. Um, I, I I would think there that variability in animal data is, could be attributed to to more uncertainties uh, associated with with performing such studies. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Zong has a question. Thank you, Sean, biostatistician from Washington University. So I've got a question for uh, Dr. Miku and maybe another one for Dr. Carter. The first one, I want to get a sense of, uh, again, to the, to the cutoff you're, you're using. My understanding is there are two total of 19 approved drugs. And your cutoff are entirely based on the 19 numbers in the uh, prescription information. Is that correct? Uh, yes. If, if the prescription information gave a window, give an interval, what do you use then? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I, I don't know if this is actually real. So sometimes it's a prescription give you a window from one, one number to the other number, some interval. Then you use the smaller one or the bigger one? Yes, uh, thank you for, for asking the uh, question. Uh, we used uh, mean uh, administered activity in that, in that range. And sometimes in prescribing information is uh, per weight, patient, patient weight. But we, and for, and for that case, we used an average uh, human uh, adult of 70 kilograms to calculate that mean uh, administered activity. Right. So I think you mentioned in your literature review, there are some studies, clinical studies, that are also on the approved drugs. So my question is, are any of those used in your, in your derivation of the cutoff? Yes, because those were reviewed uh, when the drug was approved. So in the derivation of the cutoff, that, those are included. Uh, Okay. In, so, in the data uh, of the label, the clinical data is, is uh, included in that, in that uh, determination of right. the recommended dosing. Okay, that's great. So you also give a percentage of the clinical studies in your, in your literature review that are exceeding the cutoffs and the percentage range from 30 to some higher percentages. What is the message you try to, to convey there? Are those studies uh, have a worse safety profiles in some sense? In addition to what you showed, they're, they're uh, having a higher uh, effective doses typically. Yes, uh, thank you for that. So the um, the reason I showed that was to look at the ex clinical experience with investigational drugs, compare that with the approved drugs and the relative uh, do uh, radiation dose between the two. Uh, the 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 effective dose was slightly different uh, as ex uh, in the investigational drug. Higher administrative activities could be could have been administered higher activities uh, higher than the than the mean AA of the approved drug. Um, the, the largest difference is it is in the organ absorbed dose estimate because that could be even higher than the effective dose, uh, whole body effective dose. Uh, the the message is to um, uh, to present collective clinical experience with uh, all available pet drugs and put these mean uh, uh, AA values into perspective if we were to use them as uh, recommendations later. Great, that's very helpful. My, my last question maybe uh, involved Dr. Uh, Carter's uh, uh, presentation as well. So in your presentation, uh, Dr. Pnim uh, Ku, you, you give a hypothetical stochastic risk index 
And in Dr. Carter's presentation, there is a really nice table of the adverse events related to those drugs. So I wonder whether the FAIRS database also follow things like the, the development of cancer or some other conditions in the long term, uh, uh, whether that type of information will eventually be available to those approved drugs so that uh, the risk index may not have to be based on a hypothetical uh, uh, situation. So thank you very much for your question. Um, in regards to events like cancer with drugs, uh, we see that FAIRS is much better for adverse events that are rare and also um, have a temporal relationship with the drug. Um, events of cancer, if it occurred 20 years after the patient um, received the PET drug, um, there would have to, um, the, the, the individual reporting would have to, um, you know, submit that they think that the PET drug had a link to the cancer or at least have the PET drug as part of the um, past medical history for the patient. Um, so the, the cancers are, are, are difficult um, to identify in FAIRS. However, um, we do also within our office have the Division of Epidemiology, and they are often looking at epidemiologic data. And um, it, it, I believe that that might be a better source for that. Um, but there are um, multiple um, attempts to look at post-marketing data, whether it's the adverse events or epidemiologic studies. Great, thanks. I have no more questions. Okay, uh, Dr. Singhani. Hi, this is Rupa Sangani. Thank you for the presentations. I had a question specifically about um, F18 because it has the widest range of mean values, but yet we also have the most data. We have its um, the most number of animal and human trials, the most number of already FDA approved agents. With the literature search you've done, is there anything to point towards either looking at a specific ligand or a specific target organ that might help further refine the F18 target so it's not quite so broad? And could that be used in, in the cutoffs? Um, thank you for the question. You're, you're correct. F18 has, uh, uh, there is more uh, F18 clinical studies and uh, the, the variability is, is longer. Um, in the cutoff, I didn't, we didn't uh, consider the specific uh, targeting me mechanism uh, and, and target organ uh, when determining the cutoff. However, we did look at the published studies and uh, the type of uh, molecule, uh, targeting molecule in, in, in these different radiopharmaceuticals. Um, I didn't show that in my presentation. Um, that is part of our literature review. Um, we didn't consider that uh, because we, we, um, our approach, initial approach was to um, base our uh, determination of this cutoff so to say uh, cutoff uh, based on the safety um, collect uh, collected uh, I'm sorry findings of the safety of the approved drugs uh, um, up to now um, but that will that is part that was part of the literature review uh, uh, and, and it will be part of the published uh, article Thank you. I have no further questions. Uh, Dr. Herskovich. Thank you. This is Peter Herskovich with a question for the first FDA speaker. Um, in uh, you plan on using the administered activity as per package inserts um, as uh, the basis for your thresholds, although informed by RDRC limits and the published literature uh, for investigational drugs. For F18, there are many approved uh, 
drugs, as well as a large investigation of literature for C11, gallium, 68, fewer approved drugs, but a very large published literature. Um, in contrast, though, for copper 64, there is just one approved drug and relatively few human studies. Perhaps I'm wrong, but I saw eight in one table. So do you think, given the relative paucity of data from copper 64 in relation to the other radionuclides, that copper 64 should be included in your approach of using uh, package insert administered activity? Should it be included or lumped in with, say, C11, F18, where there is a very large amount of data. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Eskovic, for that very relevant question. Um, we decided to include copper 64 given the uh, relatively lower radiation profile, but you're right, there is less, uh, there is only one approved drug um, for copper 64 and less clinical studies. Um, uh, this was, uh, we included it in the shorter lived uh, half life radionuclides uh, when compared to other longer lived ones. So, th therefore, we included it in, in this group. Um, uh, yes, uh, um, thank you. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Dr. Applegate? Thank you. I uh, also had a question for Dr. Pliku, um, and I really appreciate um, all of her responses and um, depth of knowledge. Uh, this is regarding the, the review and the analyses. If there was, since I haven't heard anything and may have missed it, any um, uh, comment on you uh, the use of uh, this these agents in children or potentially pregnant women, uh, if she would comment on um, anything that she uh, came across um, and potential FDA review um, in those two populations. Um, and also if, well, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Applegate, for the question. Um, I, uh, I think those that patient population falls under the more uh, population with higher radiation risk. Um, and um, I didn't, uh, th these recommendations apply to uh, adult patients, uh, not pediatric patients, or this approach under consideration that we are discussing. And um, in, in, the, in my scheme, I think that would fall into the population with higher risk uh, or higher expected risk. Okay, okay. That, that answers my question. Thank you. Oh, okay. Um, we will now take a break. Uh, we're reconvening at uh, 310 Eastern Time. Panel members, please remember there will be no chatting or discussion of the meeting topics with other panel members during the break. Additionally, you should plan to reconvene around 3 p.m. to ensure that you're connected before we reconvene at 3.10 p.m. Thank you.
We will now reconvene the meeting. As there are no registered open public hearing speakers, we will take the remaining time to um, answer any clarifying questions. Please use the raised hand icon to indicate that you have a question. And remember to put your hand down after you have asked your question. Please remember to state your name for the record before you speak and direct your question to a specific presenter if you can. If you wish for a specific slide to be displayed, please let us know the slide number if possible. As a gentle reminder, it would be helpful to acknowledge the end of your question with a thank you and the end of your follow-up question with that is all for my questions. So we can move on to the next panel member. Uh, we have an FDA hand raiser. I don't know the name. Hi, uh, this is uh, Anthony Fertinos, um, clinical team leader again in the Division of Imaging and Radiation Medicine. I uh, just wanted to take this opportunity to um, follow up on a couple of the uh, questions uh, for the FDA presenters. Um, with respect to the, the scope of the approach under consideration. Um, it, it, some on the panel may um, be under the impression that uh, the uh, activity uh, values um, under, under consideration apply to um, all patients during the development of a new pet drug or, or potentially even to the entire um, pre-market and post-market uh, population. Uh, another way of saying this, for example, is for the copper 64 um, uh, approved agent that uh, you know all future copper agents would be expected to have that uh, administered activity, or at least that would be a path of least resistance. And I, I want to make very clear that that's not the scope uh, of consideration under the opposed approach. What we're talking about is the first, essentially the first human subject or subjects uh, uh, probably most formally referred to as a, a pre-phase uh, one dosimetry cohort. Um, and it's specifically that that population of, of um, phase one um, study subjects uh, and, you know, limited to sponsors who do not want to perform uh, animal dosimetry studies. So um, another way of saying this is that uh, phase one clinical dosimetry is required for any new pet drug, and and all those questions about an antibody having a special biodistribution, and exploring for the um, lowest adequate dose, uh, et cetera, that that's still that would still be our standard recommendation for dose optimization, and and um, and we would expect that there would be uh, escalation and de-escalation rules, in IND opening protocols based, uh, conditional again, on the clinical dosimetry that would be drug specific and is still required. So I'm sort of just trying to make an overall scope chop um, if, if any on the committee are under the impression that um, we're talking about administered activities, you know, for um, uh, the entire population for a given drug. Thank you. Back to Jacobs. My question actually had was related to uh, what just came up here, uh, what was just uh, clarified. Uh, my view of what is being proposed here is that for a brand new pet drug, preferably C11 or F18, uh, the sponsor would go to the FDA and say, we don't think we need to do animal preclinical studies for the following reasons. And the FDA would either agree or disagree at that point. And they would say, uh, yeah, but you're planning on, st on, st on studying very young people with very high doses, so we don't think that's a good idea, or something like that. So it is not, it is more a guidance approach than anything else. That's my, my question is, if I got this right, then that's to the last speaker. Yes, precise, precisely, and and um, the uh, uh, you know the approach under consideration is essentially a clarifying and, and streamlining approach uh, on on uh, this division's uh, you know part to say that uh, you know on, in general if the 
administer activity that you're proposing for the this first human cohort is less than that for corresponding approved products, and you want to skip animal dosimetry study, and you still plan to do phase one clinical dosimetry and to de-escalate and find the right dose, et cetera, then this is just, it's just clarifying a, a pathway forward in a public open way, so in, instead of doing it on a per IND uh, basis. So it's, it's, not okay. an, it's not an open uh, get out of jail free. It's a, the assumption is, is that in many cases you are clearly able to justify it, and in other cases you wouldn't. Yes. Okay, thank you. Very, very helpful. Are there any other clarifying questions? If not, the committee will now turn to its attention to address the task at hand, the careful consideration of the data before the committee, as well as the public comments. We will now proceed with questions to the committee in panel discussions. I would like to remind public observers that while this meeting is open for public observation, public attendees may not participate except at the specific request of the panel. Uh, after I read each question, we will pause for any questions or comments concerning its wording. So if we can display the first question. So it's discuss the sufficiency of review data from animal or human studies involving F18, C11, gallium 68, copper 64, rubidium 82, and nitrogen 13 to allow a reasonable calculation of radiation absorbed dose to the whole body and critical organs upon first in human administration of a new pet drug containing one or more of these radionuclides. So one thing we would like to discuss is whether or not this wording is clear. If you have any comments about the wording, please raise your hand. Okay, if not, I will, uh, Mark, Dr. Minton. Um, well, actually, given the lack of comments, I was going to say that I thought it was, it was clear, but I realized, and so I could stop there because I think the next question is going to say discuss what we think about the question. So I will pause and let you continue, um, Dr. Royal. Okay. <laughs> but yes, I thought it was clear. Well, it's good because you anticipated what the next thing. Uh, so now that um, there have been no questions or comments concerning the, the question, uh, we will now open the question for discussion. And I guess I'll take the chairman's prerogative and just make a comment here. Uh, one of the things I'm struck by is we've spent an awful lot of time talking about um, issues related to measuring effective dose and um, some limitations of measuring effective dose. And I would just point out that the connection between effective dose and risk is also tenuous. Um, for example, if you did a study with an effective dose of X in someone who had a life expectancy of less than 10 years, the risk in that person sort of approaches zero. On the other hand, if you do that same dose, no variability in, in knowing what the dose is in an 18-year-old, uh, it's going to be several times greater than that same dose in a 60-year-old person. So um, uh, although risk is related to, to dose, it's also related to age of exposure and life expectancy. Um, Dr. Jacobs. Um, yeah, I, I think that from the data there, first of all, I agree with you 100% that uh, the, the risk is not, is not high in somebody in my age group, for sure. But uh, for children, it certainly is relevant. But the other thing is the amount of data available for F18 and C11 it seems to me is clearly sufficient. I'm not convinced that we have enough data 
to the gallium or the copper to really make a reasonable calculation. And that for that, I'm willing to have an argument with whoever would like to have one. Okay, would someone like to argue in favor of um, this proposal for other radionuclides besides for F-18 and copper-11? Uh, Dr. Larson? Well, I, <clears throat> I wouldn't call it an argument, but uh, remember that the, that the scope as was uh, nicely defined by the last speaker is uh, for a very specific and limited indication. That's really to to move uh, more rapidly to a first in human dosing, uh, <clears throat> and that uh, that to me uh, is is important here because. It will greatly accelerate, certainly, the development of um, uh, radio pharmaceuticals with gallium or copper, I think, because it will eliminate the need for costly uh, preliminary studies. And we are talking about very low uh, doses here. We're talking about, I mean, uh, the, the issue of safety, for example, comes up, but and certainly uh, all of us want to use the doses that as low as reasonably acceptable but the these are not doses for which there is really firm data that there is a lot of um potential uh risk and uh so so in that sense um i would say that this is a reasonable a starting point. Now, you could argue a little more about copper, I suppose, uh, because it does have a 12-hour half-life, which is not, not insignificant. Uh, but rubidium and nitrogen and gallium all are really are, are really pretty low. So, so I would say that um, <clears throat> I would it's true that we would feel a lot more comfortable if there was the same numbers with gallium and copper in terms uh, of that, but uh, in terms of the, uh, the this sufficiency of reviewed data. But uh, nonetheless, I think that incorporating that with a concept of that we're really talking about very safe doses, which have been previously used extensively in patients, even in the case of copper, um, I, I would argue that it that we could go ahead with this list. Um, one of the things that I was really struck by in Dr. Pleiku's um, presentation, she so, showed the slide of what the effective dose was for, for Becquerel, for all of these traces, and then uh, I-125, I-124, and zirconium, and it did seem like these traces were significantly, it would give significantly lower doses than, than the other two traces. Um, so it kind of made sense to me anyways that we might group all of these together. Oh, a lot of raised hands. Uh, Dr. Minton? Yeah, thank you, um, Mark Minton. Um, I am, um, I, I feel similarly uh, that, um, that while there's more data in one or two of these, um, I felt like the way the question is worded is that there is actually data that can allow a reasonable calculation. I, I would argue that for the tracers that have the longer half-life and the least amount of data, for instance, the copper 64 would be in that category, um, you would I, would, I would expect that um, when the FDA actually calculates what they would consider a threshold dose, you could conceivably say we can do the less data, we would be more conservative and, and, and be on the lower side of that. But I think that there is actually demonstration with multiple different ways that we've calculated the effective dose for all of these tracers. And as you just pointed out, Henry, and I was going to point out, the half-life of these means that you can collect images 
um, you know, within those half-lives, um, reasonably high quality images without having high amounts of dosimetry, um, which is not quite as true when you have the much longer half-life um, agents where they end up ha having a lot more dose to the patient um, for the amount of imaging you can get out of them in a reasonable time. So I would say that all of these have enough data that one can make a reasonable risk assessment and calculate a, uh, a level of dose that is safe. I'm not saying they should all be exactly the same formula for doing it. Um, like I said, um, it could be that um, ones with a little longer half-life, you'd want to be a little more conservative in your calculation. But I think all of them could be used to generate a, a first-in-human administrative sort of threshold. Thank you. Uh, Terry Gillespie? Hi, everyone. I just want to put a patient view into this. You know, I've been having PET scans once a year, sometimes twice a year for 20 years. And this kind of bothers me that you're willing to, to do a calculation and not proof on a human being that who is using these drugs really need, need the scan. They need the PET scan. They need to find out what's going on and not to make it worse for them. If they're doing a first time pet drug and they're already sick, um, I don't know. The calculation doesn't seem like a risk that I'd want to take, but would have to take. Does that make sense? I'd have to take it because I need the PET scan to see what's going on. Would I want to? No, because you guys have no idea. You're guessing. Something to think about. If your loved one was in the same situation as I am, 20-year lung cancer survivor, have to have that PET scan or CT scan. Have to every year. Some people are going three months every three months. Some people are going once a month. It's a lot to think about when you're guessing at the dosage. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Herskovich. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is Peter Herskovich um, with comments. First, I do want to say that I want to congratulate FDA staff for doing an outstanding literature review and analysis, and I hope they can uh, publish their results at one uh, at some point. Um, and the question is, did they provide uh, the, our 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 friend standard? They've received extensive review with respect to dosimetry and safety, and I think provide a reasonable reference data along with all the. Uh, extensive reports of investigational drugs, especially for C11F18 and gallium. Um, we, uh, also, it's interesting to note and compare the results to the paper of 2012 by Vander Art, where um, Dr. Hallett, I believe, was one of the co-authors, and they uh, came up with the same average effective dose coefficient of roughly six microsieverts per megabecquerel for 37 C11 drugs, which is basically the same as the FDA's more extensive recent analysis. So it's excellent. It's very nice to see this agreement. Um, as um, was previously noted, I was impressed by the fact that the ED values from human studies of investigational pet drugs were typically quite low, a less than 10 millisievert or a REM for C11 and 20 millisievert, for example, for F18. But also importantly, uh, one has to consider individual organs. And in those cases, uh, from the extensive review, in general, the organs with the highest administered dose coefficients were not the organs um, of concern, for example, for, under the RDRC regulations, blood forming, lens, and gonads. And I felt that was a very uh, encouraging as well. 
However, I am still concerned that perhaps there is not enough data available for copper 64, both with its longer half-life uh, than uh, copper, fluorine, or gallium. And also, it, it could be used uh, to label antibodies, which often have a, a rather different in vivo biodistribution. So I will perhaps come in somewhere in between uh, Dr. Jacobs and uh, some of the other comments that I do think there are sufficient data um, from all the studies summarized for copper 11, F18, and gallium 68, and of course, for N13 and rubidium. But I am uh, still concerned about copper 64 with regard to sufficiency of data. Thank you. Dr. Nedro. Um, yes, I, I, I think overall the, the data presented was well done, especially for F18 and carbon 11. Um, I think based on the initial comments at the very beginning of this, I think it helped clarify. Um, but I'm just curious if maybe the FDA could um, further elaborate on this. Um, so these are to help streamline to get the initial in-human uh, dosimetry studies done at these proposed doses or a variation of those. Um, regarding, like, that's not going to be every agent that comes through, but is there a criteria for a pet agent that could potentially qualify for this radiation dose? For example, if you're doing brain imaging and you uh, have slight modifications to your small molecule or a peptide with different type of chelators, um, more so for copper 64, but fluoride 18 if you wanted to try the aluminum fluoride uh, type things, or like minor modifications or a second generation of pet agents that they want have been tested thoroughly on a first generation, or um, is that more in line with what the FDA is thinking, or is there just going to be some criteria of what agents would actually qualify to be considered uh, for this? Um, that's, I guess that's where I am. Thank you. If someone could kind of elaborate on that a bit more. So FDA has recognized that. I'd, uh, happy to respond. Uh, thank, thank you. Um, the, um, I think the. Um, sh short answer to a question is um, the, the uh, our, our interpretation of um, the applicable regulation is that there's a very little flexibility uh, re regarding the need for human dosimetry uh, if you want to go to phase two. So it, it's phase one studies must uh, perform human dosimetry for the drug under investigation and FDA uh, interpretation of uh, you know what is a new drug? It's it's a uh, um, any any variation in the structure will make it a new drug. I mean, even a new manufacturer uh, makes it a new, a new drug. So it's a uh, and there's just that that's really not the question. Uh, the 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 uh, so to answer your question directly, it's uh, um, you know the scope here is just the need to perform animal dosimetry data for that. For, for a given product prior to essentially clinical dosimetry um, and, and trying to create a flexible, a flexible approach given that the number of, you know, the, the, the studies under, the studies we see for phase one, uh, during phase one, they have a huge variety of aims. Um, some are, you know, carefully dose escalating, which uh, there's a lot of clinical pharmacology principles for dose optimization that, are, are uh, independent of our, our discussion here, and those don't go out the window uh, whether or not you get um, animal dosimetry data. Um, but it's, it's a very narrowly tailored question about the, the need for animal dosimetry data, recognizing essentially that as soon as the clinical dosimetry data is in, in hand, um, the, the, those, those prior animal dosimetry estimates really play no role. They, they don't go into labeling. They don't, they don't go into decisions about raising or lowering the dose, uh, the, the activity for, for future cohorts. And so it's it's we're sort of narrowly focused on this question of the need for animal dosimetry data, but the the approach is, is isotopes uh, for the for the isotopes uh, listed. Thank you. 
Okay, Dr. Dewaraji. Um, yes, um, so my question is, I don't know if this is a separate discussion, but related to- Please, please um, state your name and your- Uni Devaraja from University of Michigan. Um, I'm not sure if this is a separate discussion, but I would like to know what the uh, status is regarding mass, the chemical to the toxicity or mass dose uh, requirements with animal studies, because I know that it's been very hard to get data on that. But we've been looking at some PSMA studies where we're trying to get some mass dose information and how much animal data is available for that. Is that a consideration here also? Hi, answering um, <clears throat> that question. This is Jonathan Cohen. Um, so, regarding the extent of non-clinical data that's re recommended or to support a first-in-human study or phase one study, I mean that's a mainly case by case basis, depending upon the type of um, what the target is, uh, what available. Uh, published literature there is, what available non-clinical data, and that's also kind of outside the scope of the symmetry. I mean, typically, um, when follow, we recommend um, sponsors that are developing products, you know, follow the um, microdose guidance and stay within the, those limits of less than 100 micrograms for small molecules, 30 nanomoles for pep, for proteins and biologics, and you know, more details are, you know, generally, you know, prior to submitting an IND with the meeting request. I don't know if that clarifies for you. So that, that's not going to change. You're still going to require the animal studies for uh, chemical toxicity and... Um... Okay. Yes, uh, we we're still going to recommend that, you know, one does um, tox studies to support their um, development unless they can provide justification for not doing those studies. I see. Yeah, I, I, I feel there's sufficient data for the dosimetry, animal dosimetry or clinical dosimetry, but uh, in general, it has been quite difficult to find uh, information on chemical toxicity or mass dose information from any of these approved agents. Thank you. Welcome. Are there any other comments from the panel? Comments or questions? Uh, Dr. Zong? Thank you, Sean. Again. So I'm going to just uh, comment from uh, maybe just a, a statistical point of view. Uh, certainly, uh, if you see uh, there is only one drug within a uh, radio nucleotide class, and the, all the <clears throat> Statistics or the cutoffs are based on one drug. There is a there is a, a kind of like negative information, and, and that's just from a, a purely uh, statistical point of view. You just don't have like the the C eleven or F eighteen. You just don't have many drugs to support your conclusion. So other comment, I think I already made uh, some related comment uh, just an hour or two ago. It's about the stochastic risk. I think it, your data shows in a hypothetical 18-year-old showed somewhere between five-fold to, if I recall correctly, to 20-fold increase of uh, the risk of uh, cancer kidney. Um, I would love to see some kind of like real data if if available. I know that's not in the in the affairs database, but perhaps some other things making people realize what that really mean as a function of many other factors, sex, age, all those things we just talked about. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, I think Dr. Balch, I believe that's his name, mentioned some of the studies you're doing. I do think some of, if that's real world data uh, on the pet drugs, that could be really important to look into. 
I think the data that you were citing was a 5% increase in cancer risk as opposed to a five-fold cancer risk. Is that 5% or 20%? We, we'd have to see the slide again. Um, I think that's slide 25 from Dr. Pniku's uh, presentation. Uh, it was a four-fold uh, increase for copper 64 as compared to F18 FDG. So that that uh, that was the highest difference. Fourfold. So you're saying that the risk was four times greater than it would have been for F18. Yes, but for that unrealistic. The lifetime risk of getting cancer is, you know, 25% of dying of cancer. So uh, four times that would mean there'd be a 100% chance that you'd die of cancer. But again, the fourfold increase is that um, compared to F18. Okay, Dr. Balch. Yes, West Balch, um, University of Florida. Uh, just a quick comment on, on this risk. We've been talking about risk index. Um, the, other than, uh, aside from the effective dose, the risk index um, does factor in, um, to the best of our knowledge, age and sex-specific uh, variations in, in risk. And they're coming from studies of the atomic bomb survivors supplemented by other studies. Uh, but there's huge confidence uh, um, uh, uncertainties on those risk estimates. And so we should never presume that they apply to any particular patient. They're really, it's really just a measure of risk to be optimized to image quality benefit. It's really a tool for dose optimization uh, and, and we really need to be careful about whether it's, it's a meaningful risk to any particular patient uh, undergoing these very low activity uh, administrations. Thank you. Dr. Applegate? Yes, um, Kimberly Applegate. Um, I wanted to ask, and I, I tried to put it in the chat, to have for all of this discussion we've been having, um, the slide where the data were provided for humans and animals um, that um, Dr. Pliku had for what was available, and it had the relative data points where there were many, as um, Dr. Uh, Chingy had mentioned, the statistics were quite um, adequate for, um, you know, for the main um, pet agents that we use today but not so much. Um, so for F-18 and, and carbon-11 and maybe gallium, but not so much for the others. And so if, it, if we had that in front of us when we were having this discussion, I think it would help us um, in determining, you know, where we might come to a more consensus uh, in our discussion. And it would, at least it would help me. And so I'm asking if, if that can be done, if we can have that one slide um, put in front of us because we don't have as much data um, on the less used um, radionuclides. So there was a slide that had all of the radionuclides, including IA124 and zirconia. That would be a nice slide to display. Thank you. Uh, Henry, I think this corresponds to tables three and four in our printed packet. Can the FDA display the slide? Uh, which of Dr. Piku's slides was it? Um, so it's the slide that has the yes. effect, effective dose for all the radionuclides, including um, zirconia and iodine. Um. Slide 19. Yes, that's the slide. So if you just focus on the right hand side, there's there's a ton of data and very and low variability um, for well for looks like for carbon 
You mean left side, Kimberly, right? The left hand side, yeah, the left hand side of the table, um, but not so much for the right hand side. Yeah, someone commented about having only one data point for Copper 64. There are at least a lot of data points displayed on this slide. Yeah, that's true. There was another. Um, the slide right before that, number 18, I think it's got more detail that yeah. you can see. Yeah, that. yeah, that one. I was concerned about the Copper 64 because it was not very much of them. Yeah. So I am supposed to summarize what the uh, panel thinks. And I'm not sure that I'm ready to do that yet. Um, um, maybe we should just sort of quickly go through um, all of the panel members uh, with this slide up. And you could tell us whether or not you would want any of these um, six radionuclides excluded from um, having sufficient data to um, avoid animal dosimetry prior to phase one studies. Could we also have the next slide because it had the animal and the human? Sure. I don't know if we can have both so of them. I'm going to just go down the roster of members and ask you where you stand. And I'm going to start with Dr. Balch. Um, I'm a little confused in that the Copper 64 data seemed disparate between the this slide and the previous slide. So, but I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll say I support the the proposed list uh, as presented to us by FDA. Okay, uh, Dr. Hackney. I have the same concern as Dr. Bolts. I'm not sure what to do about the copper because it doesn't seem to match between those two data sets, and maybe we just need more time to look at it, but certainly accepting that, I'm happy with the suggestion from the FDA and I echo Dr. Hershkovitz's uh, congratulations for the very well done presentation. Okay, uh, Dr. Hershkovitz. Um, I'm, I, I think there's more than enough data to support uh, copper 11, fluorine 18 and gallium 68. I do have some reservations about copper 64 with regard to the uh, pos paucity of data and its longer half-life. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jacobs? If I may, uh, yeah, has a comment? Um, uh, I don't see a hand raised. Who, who has a comment? There it is. Okay. Uh, FDA has the hand raised. Just, just very briefly, the uh, uh, with respect to this question of the discrepancy between uh, the, the two slides, it, one is, uh, uh, as was mentioned, contains um, both human uh, and, and animal data, and, um, and the other, uh, and, and the previous one is, is a subset of the human. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Dr. Jacobs? Uh, yes, I'm with Dr. Herskowitz here. I think there's more than enough data, except the, I'm a little concerned about the copper because there's so few of them and it's a longer half-life. On the other hand, uh, a careful implementation of it might be acceptable as well because I think the FDA will be looking very closely at what's being proposed by someone. So okay. um, no question about all of them but the copper. Okay, thank you. Dr. Oates? Yeah, I'm fully supportive of all uh, six of the radionuclides. Um, I found this discussion to be a fascinating, great presentations, great discussion, great deliberation, but I'm, I'm in favor of all six of them being put forward. 
Back to St. Honey. I share similar concerns about copper 64 as the others, given its longer half-life and a smaller amount of data. But I think the approach, as was mentioned at the beginning of this session, is really what's important. And so I support all six. OK, Dr. Min. Yeah, um, I, I also support all six. I, I understand the concerns about copper, but I, I don't think there's anything mysterious. It's, um, it, 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 it's going to behave, I think, in a pretty predictable way, and, and its longer half-life means that that's the far right of that set of curves there. But I don't think anything unexpected will happen with it, so I'm, I'm happy with um, all six. Uh, Dr. Dirawani? Sorry, I keep mispronouncing your name. <laughs> I support the suggestions uh, as it is for all six of them. I think there's okay. plenty of data. Thank you. Uh, Terry Gillespie? In listening to the scientific part of this, um, I guess I could agree that all six don't have to do animal trials before human, hoping. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Larson. Yes, uh, I agree with all six, especially in the scope has been defined by our FDA colleagues. Dr. Nidro. Um, I, I agree also that all six should be fine within the scope, as just stated, the FDA. Um, and uh, I'm sure, as it has been presented multiple times, that the consideration of the pharmacokinetics of the agent, especially for copper 64, will be a factor in determining if animal dosimetry is needed or not. Um, Dr. Royo is in favor of all six. And I, I mean, I would just say we're not eliminating the need for human dosimetry. It's just the order in which it would be. Uh, obtained, and it would be obtained in a very small number of people. Dr. Zong? I share some of the concerns I expressed already about some of the uh, radionuclide drugs, but I think the strength of this is uh, the data are based on the approved data uh, drugs, which we know uh, uh, their safety profile pretty well. So, so I, I go with all uh, the six drugs, six uh, classes without uh, uh, the animal dosimetry. And Dr. Balch has his hand raised. Yeah, West Balch University. <laughs> A lot of my colleagues are saying they're fine with all six, but there's seven here. So I just want to clarify: when you say you're you're okay with all six, does that <laughs> or 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 did people mean to say seven and they said six? So I just want to clarify that, Henry. Thank. You. And now, now I'm counting them: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you must be a mathematician. <laughs> uh, yes, there are seven, and I. I believe that everyone was referring to the seven, not the six. Okay, so my summary of the uh, discussion of this uh, first question is that uh, probably three quarters of, of the panel members um, uh, agreed with including all six radionuclides and uh, a quarter of, uh, thought that- uh, you, you mean seven? of all seven radionuclides, and um, uh, maybe 25% thought that uh, COPPA-64 should be treated differently. Okay, if we could have um, the display of question number two. Hey, I just want to ask um, uh, Henry, this is Kimberly Applegate, um, if uh, I am a voting member, um, I believe I am? Uh, yes, you are. Right. So I would also like to vote. Um, oh, I didn't call your name, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, I also uh, agree with the FDA proposal. They're all seven uh, of these uh, radionuclides um, would be appropriate uh, with uh, 
going forward. And um, although there is some, there's less, there are less data for copper. Thank you. And Dr. Sanghani has his name, has the name, has her name hand raised. Yeah, just go back. It is six, correct? Because O O15 was on the previous slide, but I do not believe it is part of the six that we are actually looking at. So this slide has the current, the actual six we are voting on. So Dr. Bulch was just trying to confuse us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, okay. The slide that we were looking at had seven. So yes. But the, what we're voting on is F18, carbon 11, gallium 64, copper 64, rubidium 81, and uh, nitrogen 13. Okay, I think we can move on to question two. So the um, question two is discuss the reasonableness of the- Dr. Rowe, if I can jump in, I um, just want to clarify that this is not a voting question, so a discussion question. Yes. Before we move on to question discussion question two, just wanted to clarify that um, question number one is a discussion question. So panel members shared their opinions um, and their remarks, but it was as a discussion, not as a voting question. Thank you. Thank right. you. Okay, so question two is discuss the reasonableness of the approach under consideration involving administered activity values for new PET traces in, uh, containing F18, C11, copper 68, sorry, gallium 68, copper 64, rubidium 82, and nitrogen 13. Uh, since that phase one studies will both initially administer one or more activity levels less than the value and collect sufficient human dosimetry calculations that may generally be found safe to proceed from a radiation safety perspective in the absence of dosimetry data based on prior animal administration of the new pet drug under investigation. Um, so any um, questions about the wording of this uh, question? Okay, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, so I'm going to assume that the- I have a question, sorry. Okay. Uh, this like is Unidev Raja. Yeah. I'm a little yeah. confused uh, um, uh, that um, I thought we said that it was going to be you to collect human data for the first patient only, but here it says, I'm confused by the wording here. I mean, how, where that previous, one of the previous presenters had mentioned something about doing the dosimetry only for the first patient. Um, so can someone from the FDA clarify how many patients you would anticipate um, be studied for dosimetry in phase one? Sure. Uh, the, uh, again, the, um, the regulation under consideration is that phase one studies, um, you know, must include uh, human human dosimetry. So there's some flexibility um, uh, in terms of, of when that occurs. And, and our the approach here is designed um, to accommodate um, uh, both uh, some of the specific considerations, for example, mentioned uh, in, in individual labs by our, our guest speakers, uh, but also um, not not um, be limited to to those specifics. Um, so, in short, uh, our general recommendation, though, would be that the clinical dosimetry studies occur as as soon as possible during phase one investigation, and um, and generally, uh, dosimetry studies um, sort of uh, follow clinical pharmacology. Um, um, uh, logic in terms of uh, the size, the, the number of patients studied. So we're typically think, uh, in the range of six to, to 20 um, for uh, um, sort of, the, those are common rules of thumb, but they're not statistically powered or, or anything like that. I hope that addresses the question. 
Um, my question was mostly to regarding, I, I thought there was a mention of doing one patient at a lower activity. Where does that come in? The first so patient. The, the approach under consideration could include that. Uh, um, uh, so, so protocols that describe that sequence exactly would certainly uh, qualify as generally uh, safe to proceed from a radiation perspective. But um, the uh, um, the approach is, is uh, under, the, the approach is, is uh, designed to be um, sort of more flexible and, and not to require any you know anyone uh, to follow you know a specific lab's uh, recommendation or approach. So, so it, the, the approach you mentioned would be uh, would qualify, but it's not the only approach that would qualify. Thank you. Any additional uh, clarifications regarded, uh, regarding this question? Okay, um, I think we need to have the table of uh, recommended uh, administered activities uh, for each of these radionuclides displayed. May I have a slide number, please? I believe it was table two in Dr. Fleckow's presentation, corresponding to table five in the printed document. Slide 21. Yeah, we're talking about the second to the last column, correct? Yes. So the way I understand this table is that um, um, one would be able to uh, start doing an FDG dosimetry study in phase one study using eight milliliters of activity for flooding 18, 15 for carbon 11, et cetera. Um, so the question before us is whether or not we agree with this table is the way I understand it. And the only thing I would comment on is, um, you know, some of the uh, activities have been rounded off. Some of them are reported in three digits as suggesting more um, significant figures than are really warranted. And I would just, you know, round them off probably to military values. So like gallium 68, I might put four, I might put 40 for uh, rubidium. Any other comments about that column of suggested activities? Jacobs uh, here. Paula, uh, Dr. Yes. Jacobs. Yeah, Paula Jacobs. It was my understanding that this would be the upper limit, that uh, it would also be, in many cases, recommended that it would not be necessary to use the entire amount for your first patient, that you would start off with whatever would allow you to get a, a decent image to just verify that it didn't go someplace that you weren't expecting, and that then you would go on and do a regular dosimetry in the normal fashion. Hey, can someone from the FDA address that comment? We, we uh, agree. Uh... And um, you know, and from clinical pharmacology principles, uh, definitely recommend that uh, you know phase one investigation explore multiple um, multiple administered activities, and and so this is to be considered you know the upper bound prior to uh, obtaining clinical dosimetry. Certainly not a lower bound. Uh, Dr. Balch. Um, my camera can't turn on. Yeah, I have a couple of comments. Um, um, the um, can you hear me, Henry? Yes. Yeah. Can. Um, uh, yeah, I would round off the 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 values, the megabecquerels, to two significant figures instead of three. Um, and it's my understanding. So if you could start, so the proposal is that you could start uh, uh, 
first in human trial, if the administered activity is below this level without the need for preclinical animal data. Am I saying that correctly? Yes, exactly. Okay, yeah. So Thank I'm, you. I'm kind of hearing two different things because I thought um, uh, Dr. Bolch just said you could start at this dose. And then I thought I heard the FDA say uh, good pharmacologic practice would be to start from a lower dose. Well, these were I the upper, upper limits. Right. On I mean, both statements are true, essentially. Yeah. Uh, we have our recommendations, and then we also have a principle of flexibility. And, and, and of course, what's not stated in the question and probably should be is the, uh, the uh, it, it was certainly covered in the briefing document and the slides that um, the, the population under study needs to be similar to the approved uh, population. So, so uh, uh, and I, it's not explicitly in that one sentence of the question, so I want to um, make sure to highlight that uh, there's always clinical judgment in terms of the uh, investigational population. Okay, Dr. Nedro. Yes, um, I like the, the main recommended um, administered activity. I'm just wondering if the FDA considered uh, doing it uh, based on millivectorals per kilogram to have a more um, normalized dose to patients. Uh, the, m most of the approved um, products, especially uh, for adult use, um, uh, are not um, weight-based. Um, so uh, even though studies that are proposing weight-based approaches uh, you know, are, are fair game, uh, it, it, uh, it would seem inconsistent with um, at least the bulk of the uh, uh, approved products to date. Dr. Herskovich. Hello, this is uh, Peter Herskovich from the NIH. Um, I would just like to make the comment about uh, those uh, data in the second to last column on the right being the upper limit, but also that they're based on the package insert and uh, in general, I think package insert doses are based on the ability of the radio pharmaceutical to be useful as a diagnostic to detect disease like a small metastasis, whereas a human initial human dosimetry studies, I think, can often require lower doses because one is typically measuring radioactivity from whole organs. So uh, I think uh, there is a fair amount of judgment that could go into it. And I think the folks in the FDA did mention uh, starting off with lower doses uh, than in that table. But uh, in terms of opinion, I think those are reasonable upper limits and thresholds. And even though I did have concern for express concerns for copper 64, I do have confidence that in interactions between the investigators and the FDA, uh, this isn't going to be a blanket approval. Yes, you can use four. Uh, consideration will be built in to what the FDA approves. So um, I feel even more, somewhat more comfortable about copper 64, knowing how the FDA uh, will apply these limits. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Okay, I don't see any um, more uh, hands raised. Um, so to summarize the comments, it seems like um, the panel is uh, comfortable with uh, the um, reasonableness of this approach and um, are uh, comfortable with the uh, activity levels that are in that uh, table. Um, before we adjourn, are there any last comments from the FDA?
We greatly appreciate the discussion and uh, the preparation that went into it. Thank you very much. Okay, we will now adjourn the meeting. Thank you for the uh, to the FDA staff and to the panel members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.